so it is now going live yeah i think it is done yes so now i should uh, come back to my zoom meeting Uh, by staying in this meeting you consent to be live streamed uh, anyone who access like and watch or i got say got it right yes sir okay great <clears throat> so i think i'll check with my staff whether they are able to see the live stream
Hello, Manish. I'm here. Yeah, so Professor Barney, uh, good morning to you. And uh, yeah, we are, I think, five minutes more. We are waiting for the participants to slowly join. So we'll sure. wait for around five minutes and then we will start the session. Okay, good. Yeah. Just make sure that everything works. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, we are going, we are recording this meeting as well as live streaming it on YouTube for benefit of the other participants. Uh, so that uh, for wide dissemination of uh, the subject. So we are doing that on a very large basis. Okay, great. Yeah.
Yeah, so we are starting now. Uh, so good afternoon to all participants joining from India. And uh, good morning to Professor Mauro Berni, who has joined us from Italy. Uh, so uh, hey, today we are into the first day of the Gyan course, uh, Adversarial Signal Processing and Machine Learning with Application to Multimedia Forensics. But before we start, uh, we will just go through for all the participants who are joining across India and Professor Mauro Berni, I'll just share my institute video, which uh, tells, uh, which shows our institute and all its facilities that we have. So I'm starting sharing my screen to just show you by the time we have the participants joining us. So I'm just sharing my screen here to show the institute video. which uh, tells, uh, which shows our institute and all its facilities that we have. So I'm starting sharing my screen to just show you by the time we have the participants joining us. So I'm just sharing my screen here to show the institute
Yeah, this was a quick campus tour of our campus. So uh, because we are not able to meet in person because of the times that we are in, as well as uh, uh, the restrictions that have been imposed. So, uh, so this was actually planned as a physical course and was scheduled to happen in September 2020. But because of that, it got because of COVID, it got post postponed continuously. And today we are here doing it in the online mode. So we are glad to have with us Professor Mauro Burney. So I'll just quickly introduce him to the audience. And before we do an outline presentation quickly, so I'll just introduce him to the audience. And uh, uh, so the association with Professor Burney and myself has been from 2018, so where we met in Hong Kong. His short biography goes like this. He graduated in engineering at the University of Florence in 91. Post that, he received his PhD in informatics and telecommunication in October 95. He has carried out his research activity for more than 20 years, first at the Department of Telecommunication, University of Florence, then at Department of Information Engineering at University of Siena. Uh, so post where he currently works as a full professor. So this is the brief introduction. He is uh, a fellow of IEEE. That's what we have. To, uh, we all know he has. He is a widely acclaimed researcher in the area of information, forensics, and security. And uh, uh, he, you can also see that he's around 400 plus research publications with around 18,000 citations. He has also been the editor in chief for this uh, TIFFS, that is Transaction on Information, Forensics, and uh, and Security. His main works are in this uh, video watermarking, image watermarking. And uh, from the past, uh, I think three, four years or five years, he's been active in the area of adversarial machine learning and signal processing with application to multimedia forensics. This is the short introduction that we could have with Professor Burney here. Uh, we, without taking much time here, I'm just going to what is the schedule. Uh, hey, hey, Professor Burney, a namaskar from all our side. And with uh, on behalf of my institute as well as all, all the participants who are joining us. So coming to the, I'll just quickly give the quick outline of the uh, talk that we are going to have over these past five days. So we have planned such that Professor Burney will enlighten us more on adversarial uh, signal processing from its theoretical point of view. And I will be doing tutorial sessions with these collab notebooks, assuming the right from a beginner to a middle level. So it will be a balance between Professor Burney and me. And uh, even I am new to this particular topic, though I have read all his papers in adversarial machine learning. But to hear, to listen him live, I, I am also a student in, in that sense. So I'll also be a student in his class, whatever he is taking now. So I won't, will not be able to enlighten the entire thing, but Professor Burney would be doing it. But giving a short online uh, outline of what is the course, that is what I will be trying to do here. So we had discussed, I and Professor Burney had discussed this particular part. So let me do this. So this is my PPT here. I hope you could see this. So coming to the, uh, the outline of this Gyan course, which is a joint course uh, between myself and Professor Burney here. So the, uh, the outline is something like this, that Professor Maura Burney would be talking more on uh, the uh, adversarial parts from both the information theoretical point of view as well as from the game theory point of view along with he would introduce the mathematically preliminaries here in the initial part so that is what he's planned for today here after that he would tomorrow he would go into the source identification uh, game and also see some attacks on histogram based detection of image manipulations third day he would go on security issues in machine and deep learning from the adversarial point of view, as well as he'll try to give you examples on deep learning. Fourth day, uh, he would look into the defender's uh, uh, viewpoint, a game theoretical approach, where uh, it will be like a game being played by the defender as well as the attacker. And this is what is planned for the fourth day. And fifth day, he would be going on an emerging threat, which is the backdoor attacks, as well as the possible defenses in that. So this is what is planned for Professor Burney or for the five days. For my part, it would be I would go very simple, starting from introduction to machine learning uh, from the broad perspective, then going into collab with simple notebooks of classification and regression. So we'll try to run it today. So after Professor Mori Burney finishes his talk at around 5.30 India time, 6.30 I start and go till 9 in the night. So after that, uh, tomorrow early morning at 9.30, we go ahead with the deep learning architecture, CNN architectures, 
along with collab sessions to do that so we look at some iris petal data set and see how to do all the sort of classification that happens with simple data sets and the third day would be is planned is with regard to the deep learning models using for ensemble and boosting methods how to do it and simple example where we classify cats and dogs then the fourth day we are going into the full box software which is again an adversarial attack software which i also learned uh, for the past a year along with collab examples where we could see how it is attacking and the last day we will be going into the adversarial machine learning uh, more about adversarial learning how the um, the accuracy drops and along with the concluding remarks so these are my plans so this i will be speaking over a period of 5 days here this is my part coming to professor bernie's group he will speak more about himself but uh, like this is what his group is i regularly uh, interact with a few of his postdoc uh, scholars like uh he benedetta and always have some research papers which we send they review it and vice versa we have shared our code with them for the q1 estimation and they also do the same part so coming to where we happened to meet this is where i met professor burning uh, we we met at wips 2018 at hong kong where i was presenting my students work and it was a wonderful meeting it was non covid days Uh, and there is where the partnership began and we invited him in 2019 though it materialized but it got stuck because of the covid pandemic so that's how we couldn't have him in the campus so finally uh, my students who have helped me in this particular course designing the notebooks these are my students bibash abrant monali swayam shruti ojaswi ayush and jayant so these are the people behind so it's my duty to bring them in front because i am the face here so these are the people who worked a back door and they tried to do the notebooks and after that i prepared my ppt and went through and always we have we were on a video call because most of them are not there on the campus so with this i think i thank for the outline presentation and uh, quickly i uh, like quickly i go over to professor moro burney for his talk sir if you are ready then please go ahead I'm ready. So thank you, Manish, for your kind words and nice introduction. So I'm very glad to be here, and it's a pity that I could not join you in person because I really was looking forward to meet you. I've never been in India, so that could have been my first. So saying that. Uh, and this could have been my opportunity to visit your country for the first time in my life but then i couldn't it's a pity but i mean uh, i hope that uh, we will be able to meet in person in the future so uh, to start with i want to share my screen with you let me see if i can do it uh, and everything works so it seems that uh, uh I am disabled from screen sharing. Maybe Manish, you should allow yeah. me to do that. Sure, sure. I'll do it. Is it enabled now? It is. Yes. Let me see. So. Should go now. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, I can see. It. So the idea is that uh, I will give this presentation with an iPad, uh, so that I can annotate, write on it, uh, and point to the important parts of the slides. This means that uh, I, I I'm not able to look uh, constantly at the chat. So if you have any questions. At any moment, you can uh, just interrupt me and ask me what you want. And maybe Manish, you can look at the chat uh, for me so that if some questions arrive, you can uh, interrupt me and ask the questions. Okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, good. So this is the title uh, of, of my part of the course. And Manish already said everything. So the course will be on adversarial signal processing and machine learning, and the focus will be on multimedia forensics. I am Mauro Barney from the University of Siena, and Manish already introduced me. So stop speaking about me, and let's speak about 
the, the topic of the course. So, okay, okay, yes. So this is the outline of the course. Manish already gave it. So I will just uh, reinforce this a little bit. Today, I'm going to give you a general introduction to the topic of adversarial signal processing. And uh, I will introduce the game theory approach. And uh, I will also lay out some mathematical details for tomorrow's lecture. Because tomorrow, I will focus on adversarial. Let me see if I can. Yes. I will focus on adversarial binary detection games. I alert you that uh, tomorrow's lecture will be very mathematical. So tomorrow, basically, I will present uh, a coherent theory that I have developed over the last 10 years, studying uh, binary detection in adversarial conditions by using game theory and information theory. Then, uh, in the, in, in, and today, if I have enough time, in the last part of today's uh, lecture, I will introduce some mathematical preliminaries that including game theory and information theory that you need to understand well tomorrow's uh, class. Then uh, day three, day four, day five, I will focus on adversarial machine learning. So I will uh, leave the signal processing theoretical perspective and I will delve into more practical uh, deep learning based uh, issues. So again, I will introduce again the peculiarities of adversarial machine learning in a deep learning framework. And then I will focus on adversarial examples. In day three, I think I have time to also introduce a careful description of all the attacks, while in day four, I will care about defenses. Finally, in day five, I will introduce a new challenge, a new threat, which is backdoor attacks. This has been introduced not earlier than three years ago, I would say three, four years ago. So it's a very new emerging topic and I want to uh, present it in a quite careful way on day five. This doubt line, uh, every day is about three hours, some days a little bit more, some days a little bit less. So it is possible that some of these topics will shift into the next days or will be anticipated a little bit depending on how much time I need to introduce all the details. As I told you, at any time you can stop me if there is anything which is not clear, especially in the mathematical parts, you are free and welcome to ask any questions you want. So, as I said, the focus will be on multimedia forensics. So, most of the things that I will say are very general and can be applied to many, many fields. I've seen, you have seen from this schedule that Manish will present things uh, focusing on simple classification problems like cats and dogs uh, image classification. Well, most of the things that I will say will also, can also be applied to uh, general uh, machine learning and signal processing uh, fields. Nevertheless, uh, uh, for sake of clarity, I will present examples throughout my lectures. And in these examples, I will always draw examples from multimedia forensics and multimedia security, because this is my main research field. And so I am more familiar with those. <clears throat> so first of all, let us try with the introduction and motivation for the entire field, the entire things that I will uh, present today. So we live uh, in a wonderful world, but uh, more and more we live uh, in a digital ecosystem that surrounds us, made by internet connections, social media, and everything. And this ecosystem we live in, in a sense, looks like a paradise, a digital paradise, because there are many, many things we can do in this, uh, in this system that were not even thinkable until a few years ago. So we have very powerful search engines that can help us to retrieve any kind of information from the internet. We can work in cloud uh, so that uh, our data and the computing facilities are all 
come from the cloud. We don't need to have powerful computers because, because we can find all of them on the cloud. Uh, we can identify ourselves by biometries. We can feel the internet with contents generated directly by the users. So we can contribute to populate the internet. We can meet online as you're doing now, not uh, even if we live Maybe. a thousand of miles it. apart. And you can use, uh, I don't know, uh, the internet to gather reputation scores that we know everything about uh, journals, people, researchers, scholars. You can book hotels online in a few words. This uh, digital system surrounding us is plenty of opportunities that were not even thinkable, as I said, until 20 years ago. Yet, as uh, any place populated by humans, there are also threats, dangers. And sometimes this, uh, this system we live in looks more like a battlefield rather than a paradise. And so we have many situations where we have to be aware of possible threats. So, you know, speaking about the internet, we have denial of service attacks where some of these facilities are not available. We all know that our emails uh, boxes are flooded by spam and other non-wanted messages. The internet is populated by fake media. Not all the things that we found on the internet can be trusted. And that's why we need multimedia forensics to understand if a media we are retrieving from the internet or even any kind of data we retrieve from the internet is trustworthy or not. Uh, private networks can be intruded and violated by attackers and somebody can even steal our identity and pretend to be us and many, many other things. As you will see in day five of this course, new threats are emerging every day. So in some way, we need to protect this system against all these possible threats. And in fact, researchers are going to the rescue. There are many, many researchers with different backgrounds from different research areas that have started looking for countermeasures to all these problems that I have just mentioned. And, and here I just listed some of these possible uh, fields where countermeasures are looked for. So we have watermarking to mark and prove the ownership of media, we have multimedia forensics, trying to understand if a media can be trusted or not, or which is the origin trace back to the source that produced the media. We can filter emails to prevent spamming. We can try to classify things and objects securely. We have tools for anti-spoofing in biometrics. We can have system to detect network intrusion, secure reputation systems, and many, many, many others. And what is important here is that these countermeasures are looked for by researchers coming from the different armies with different backgrounds, looking at things with different perspectives. However, if you look at uh, all these problems and countermeasures a little bit more closely, we understand that all these diverse fields face with similar problems. Even if it is a possible problem that researchers interact with each other only to a limited extent. So people are not working in biometrics, tends to work by themselves without knowing what what people in the normal multimedia forensics do. And so the idea is that very often the same solutions are reinvented again and again. And in this way, advances proceed at a, at a, at a pace which is not as fast as it should be. But even worse, the idea is that by looking at each single research area, security area separately, we miss the global view. We don't understand which, 
what is the real essence of the problems we are facing with. Because there are many common problems, many common uh, yes, problems and issues. And uh, if you look only at our narrow fields, we miss the global view. And then solutions are less effective than they could be. And even sometimes basic concepts are even misunderstood. I mean, just to make an example, if you are familiar with uh, the multimedia security, like for instance, watermarking area and steganography, the word security has a very precise meaning. If you go on computer vision and adversarial machine learning, they use the term robustness for what we call security in other fields. So very often, even some basic definitions are misunderstood when we pass from one field to another. And even worse, we continue patching techniques, finding countermeasures for techniques thought toward in a digital paradise where everything is perfect and there is no enemy, while we should develop tools since the beginning that are thought to work in a battlefield rather than in a paradise. Otherwise, we go on patching things that have been thought to work in a completely different uh, environment. Okay, so this is the general view. Uh, today and tomorrow, I will focus on one particular problem, binary decision, which uh, turns out to be one of the most common, most recurrent problem in, in security, multimedia forensics, and all, all, all that kind of stuff. And so here I have some examples of, uh, uh, I don't know, binary decision problems commonly found in uh, multimedia security. So for instance, in, in forensics, you want to understand if a certain image was taken by a certain camera. The answer is yes or no. Or if a certain image, video, audio, is a natural video or is a synthetic one generated by GAN architecture. And again, the question is yes or no. So this is a binary decision problem. You may want to know if a certain image was resized or compressed twice, or you want to know if an image is the stego or recovery image in steganalysis and steganography. You want to decide if a certain email is a spam email or not, uh, to understand if you want to filter it out or not. In biometric authentication, you want to know if a certain face, fingerprint, iris belong to a certain person or not. You want to understand if a user is malevolent or not, for instance, in, in social media or in recommender systems. You want to understand if the level of traffic in the network is an indication of anomaly or intrusion going on. So you see here that very likely binary decision is the single most important problem to be answered in many, many security applications. Attacks are also similar in different fields. And I will give some example here. So consider, for instance, uh, the multimedia forensics case. In multimedia forensics, very often what you want to do is the following. You want to distinguish, for instance, images taken from a certain camera or deep fake videos from natural, the rest of the images. And in R0, you have, in the end, given the set of all images, what your detector is asked to do is to define a sub-region R0 in the set of all possible images, grouping, gathering together all the images that have been taken by a certain camera, or all the images generated by GAN, or all the deep fake videos. And what an attacker may want to do is to take an image or a video or a sample inside this region 
that is classified inside the region by your classifier and move it out. Generate another image, another video that now does not belong anymore to the region R0. That means that the binary detector does not classify it anymore as an image taken from a certain camera or as a deep fake video. And you want to do this under distortion constraint. Either you want to exit R0 with the minimum distortion, meaning that if you have an X here, you want to go to the closest point outside the region. And this means exiting R0 with the minimum distortion or exit R0 with a distortion constraint. So you have a constraint of all the possible images or videos at a certain distance from your X and you want to find one within this constraint that is on the other side of your detection region, okay? Many possible attacks are, exist here. If you know a little bit about multimedia forensics and watermarking, you can apply Oracle attacks, gradient attacks, blind attacks, but this is the main problem. And you have a detector and you want to take a point inside a detection region and move it out from it. And this will be the light motive of the entire five days. You have a detector and you want to move one sample in or out from a certain detection decision region. So this was multimedia forensics. If you look at watermarking, this is exactly the same. You have an object X that contains a watermark. And if you want to remove the watermark, what you want to do is to, and this blue region is the set of images judge as watermark by the watermark detector. So let me see there's something wrong here. First. Oh, okay, now it works. Good. So, and the idea is that you want to find, so this X is a watermarked image and you want to find another image that is not judged to be watermarked. So it is out from this blue region, but you want to do this with the minimum possible distortion because you want that the attacked image has a high quality. And so this is the goal of, for instance, the closest point attack in image watermarking. You have this, re, you have this uh, image X and you want to exit your boundary with the minimum possible distance from it. If you move at random, it will take a huge distortion. But if you run careful, intelligent attacks, you can find a way to estimate the boundary of this region and then find the closest point on the other side of the boundary. So you see again, if I move at random from X, I will stay inside. If I move cleverly, I go out. And this is all the distance, in my view, between robustness and security. When you have a random perturbation from X, we speak about robustness. But when you have a clever attacker that introduces a perturbation that is directed towards the output, towards the boundary of the detection region, we speak about security. I'll come back to this later. Adversarial examples in machine learning. Once again, you have a classifier and X is classified as belonging to class, to this blue class, good? And what an adversarial example want to do is to find a point Y, which does not belong anymore to the blue class, and at the same time is as close as possible to X. If you move at random 
from X. For instance, you may go in this direction. X is an image. Huh? So if you add some random noise to your in input image in a uh, convolutional neural network, for instance, very likely you will move in a direction that keeps you in the blue class. On the other hand, you may want to devise, and this is robustness. On the other hand, you may want to introduce a noise, a distortion that brings you out from the blue class with a small distortion. Ideally, you'd like to go here. How can you do that? In most of these adversarial attacks in machine learning, and, and I understood that Manish will give you some examples, will present you how to uh, build these attacks in practice. The idea there is that you start from point X and look at the gradient of the output. And then you move in a direction indicated by the gradient that will decrease the answer of the blue class with respect to your input. If you compute the direction of the gradient at the beginning and you go on in this direction, very likely you will go in a point outside the blue region, which is not as far as Y2 because you follow the gradient, you're trying to exit the region following the descent of your output. This if you move, if you estimate the gradient at the beginning, and then you move in this direction. But we know that the gradient of the classifier is not constant. So the, the direction that seems to be optimum at the beginning may not be the best one. Then you can apply iterative gradient descent, move a small step, recompute the gradient, move another small step, recompute the gradient, move another small step until you exit. And this will bring you very close to the optimum point outside the blue class, meaning the point outside the blue class, the image outside the blue class that is closest to X. So this X could be the class of cats. You have an image with a cat, outside you have dogs, and you will find Y, which is uh, an image that still looks like a cat, but is classified by a dog. This is the essence, what you want to do with adversarial attacks in machine learning. Once again, exit a certain region with a minimum distortion. Spam filtering, again, <clears throat> This is an example of an attack to spam filtering proposed 15 years ago by these guys. And once again, the idea was, uh, I will go faster here, was to take one point, an email that is considered to be a spam email, the pink region, and move it into the green region, which is the uh, non spam. Sorry. No spam. And you want to do it by modifying your email in, in the less possible way, the least possible way. Once again, configure a different setup. You're speaking about emails now, not cats and dogs, but the goal of the attack is to take something in one region of the detector and move it on the other side. Biometrics, once again. So this region is the set of faces, for instance, recognized as Mauro Barney, that's me. So this is a detector that given a face tells you if this face is, belongs to me or not. And R0 is the set with all the faces judged to belong to me. 
a goal of an attack here, it's called a hill climbing or a masquerade attack, is to take an image X that does not belong to me according to the classifier and move it inside the region with the minimum possible distortion. Same goal. Now we want to enter a region rather than exiting it, but I mean, this doesn't change much. And then many, many others. There are many other cases where the goal of the attack is to move from one detection region to another. For instance, modify a deep, fake, deep fake video so that the video is judged as a natural video by deep fake detector. In reputation system, you have a malevolent profile and you want to modify it so that it looks like a fair user. Traffic monitor, monitoring, you shape uh, your request to a server in a denial of service attack by shaping the request in such a way that this does not look anymore as a denial of service and many, many others. Given this, given that there are so many fields around facing with similar problems, isn't it advisable to devise a general theory that can give a unified view of all these areas? I think it is. And this is what I will try to introduce here. This is what I call adversarial. In this case, I would call this adversarial binary detection or binary decision or adversarial detection theory. But this is not restricted to binary decisions only. There are many, even if binary decision is the most common problem in security systems, there are many, many other situations that can be helpful. So we can have, we may want to protect the classifier, not just cats and dogs, but cats, dogs, horses, bears, eagles, and whatever you want. We can try to, to attack system that, that are clustering users. Mail classification and in pattern recognition, biometrics identification rather than verification, speech recognition, computer vision, I said it, multimedia fingerprinting, everything is not just a matter of binary decision. So rather than talking about adversarial binary decision, I guess we should talk about adversarial signal processing. So carry out any problem in signal processing or data processing, taking into account the presence of an adversary. When the signal processing tools will belong to machine learning, then we talk about adversarial machine learning, which can be seen as a branch of a more general field of adversarial signal processing, or at least they are intersected. Good, so I'll give an example. Because very often when we study adversarial problems, uh, it's easy to fall in a cat and mouse loop where attacks and defenses are developed iteratively in a, in a never ending loop. And here I have an example of this. So as I take this example from uh, multimedia forensics. I want to understand if a certain image was contrast stretch or not. And here I have an example. I like climbing on mountains. So I went on the Alps this summer and I took this picture. 
great. But uh, I like climbing, but I'm not a good photographer. So this picture is not a good one because it's too smooth. There is not enough contrast. So what I did is that I stretched the histogram of my image to get this very nice picture where now the contrast is good and I can see the mountains very well. Great. But then I don't want to reveal that I am a bad photographer. I want to pretend that this image was taken as is without histogram stretch. Good. So now it's up to the forensic analyst. Can I develop a middle to distinguish these two classes of images? Yes, it's very easy. If you know a little bit of image processing, you know that when you stretch the histogram, sorry, yes, when you stretch the histogram, the new histogram of the stretch image has typical gaps. This is how the histogram of an image should look like all gray levels in a certain range. But after contrast stretching, what you get is something like this. Now, the good part is that your histogram covers the entire range of values. So the image is very well contrasted, but there are gaps between nearby pixel values. And so if I just have a look at the histogram, it's very easy for me to distinguish between uh, uh, the, the, these different kinds of images. And also what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Good, great. So for the forensic analyst, this is very easy. Now go back to me. I want to hide this. What I should do, I want to fill the gaps. How can I fill the gaps of the histogram? I only need to add some noise because if you add noise to these values, some of these values will be moved to nearby gray levels. And then the gaps in the histogram are filled. Good. After noise addition, your new histogram will look like this. Very nice. Now it's difficult to distinguish this histogram from the other. So as an attacker, I'm happy now. Well, what could the analyst do now? Look at image noisiness to see if there is an abnormal level of noise within the image. And this is the case if you look here. If you look at the sky now, you will see that the sky that should be flat, it should be very uniform in gray levels, now has all this kind of granularity. And this is, uh, can be seen as an anomalous presence of noise and hence the defender can still understand that something bad happened to this image. Mm. Let's go back to the attacker's point of view now, what could I do? Try to remove noise. I first introduce noise to fill the gaps, but now I want to smooth the image so that uh, noise is no more so evident. And what I could do is that I could apply medium filtering. If you look at the sky now, you don't see any more this noisiness, this granular noise. And so this noise-based forensic tool does not work. Yet, if you know a little bit about medium filtering, if you look at an image like this, you realize immediately that, the image, that this image has been medium filtered because medium filter images have these flat areas and very sharp boundaries. This is very typical. And then what you could do is that uh, the defender could develop a tool to detect medium filter images. And then go on and on and on and on again. 
we enter a kind of cat and mouse loop that uh, never ends. You don't know at the end who's gonna win here. Is in the end the attacker win or will the defender have the game in the end? If you go on researching things in this way, nothing good will happen. This happens also in, in machine learning. If you think about adversarial attacks, adversarial examples, what if you know a little bit about it, what happened is that uh, uh, researchers continue developing new attacks and uh, other researchers continue developing new defenses. This is good up to a certain extent, but, but from a certain point on, this is not really useful because you end up in a loop like this and you never stop your iterations. Good. So we want to develop a theory that does its best to avoid entering this never ending cat and mouse loop. Good. How do we do? Where do we start from? There are many possibilities here. My perspective, the perspective that I'm going to uh, keep in this talk will be to rely on game theory. Good. Why? I will try to convince you that game theory is a perfect fit for adversarial signal process. Here I summarize some of these reasons. So to start with, game theory allows to give a very precise definition of what the players of this arms race is. It can give you very precise tools to define the goals of the various players and a very rigorous way of defining the possible moves that the players can play. And there are some criteria summarized by the notion of equilibrium that allows you to understand which are the best possible moves of the various players of the game under certain conditions. And by game theory, you can model social intera interactions. You can model the various constraints that constrain the moves of the various players. And there are many, many possible game structures around that you, that you can use to model different situations, different applications. And last but not least, game theory is a widely studied topic. You don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You can rely on a very large, a very vast body of results and theorems that can help you studying the adversarial uh, applications of game theory. So I don't know how familiar you are with game theory. I will just introduce this a little bit. If you know already about game theory, forgive me. If you don't, I'll try to introduce only the concepts that are needed here, because I mean, game theory is a huge field by itself. Here, I will focus on two players' games. So when you have only two parties involved, game theory is more general than this. You can have many, many, many players, but here we focus on two player games. At this point, a game is defined by these four elements, S1, S2, U1, U2. S1 is a set with all the possible moves of the first player. And these moves are usually called strategies in game theory. So player one can choose one of 
n1 possible alternatives to play the game. S2 is the same for the second player. The number of possible moves of the second player. Keep in mind that S1 and S2 can be completely different stuff or belong to the same domain. We don't care. Then we define two payoff functions. The first player wants to optimize U1. That is, U1 will tell you the gain, the payoff of the first player when the first player chooses a certain strategy and the second player chooses another strategy. So here is the trick. The payoff of the first player does not depend only on the choice of the first player, but also on the choice of the second one. So in principle, the first player would like to know what the second player will play, but he doesn't know. The same applies for the second player. The payoff of the second player, U2, depends on the choice made by the second player, but also by the choice made by the first player. And the, and the nice thing, nice, I mean, the interesting thing here is that U1 and U2 are different. So the second player will choose its move trying to optimize U2. The first player will choose its move trying to optimize U1. And so the two players may have different goals and it's not easy to understand what is the best strategies of one of the player without knowing what the others will do. In uh, adversarial signal processing, you are interested in competitive games. Games where U1 is the opposite of U2. And these are zero sum because the sum of the two payoff is equal to zero. But most importantly, these are competitive games because the two players point to different goals, opposite goals indeed. There are also cooperative games, but we don't care about cooperative games here. So we will consider this. And then there are many possible structures for game. We can have sequential games where one of the two players play first and the other play second. We can have strategic games where the two players choose their moves beforehand without knowing what the other player will do. We can have multiple, multiple moves games where the game goes on iteratively with the two players playing their moves one at a time. So all these different possible structures allow to cover many different applications. In the following, I will focus on the most classical approach, which is strategic games, where the two players decide their moves independently without knowing the choice of the other. Is this clear? Is everything clear so far? You want to ask anything? No? Is there anything you may want to ask? Please do that if uh, something is not clear. Good. Then, if everything is clear, let us give me an example. Uh, usually, games are represented by this table. This is a two player game. In the following, I will call the two players attacker and defender because we think about multimedia forensics or adversarial signal process. On the first, on, on the column, no, sorry. Each row represents one possible choice of the first player, the defender. 
So the defender will choose, for instance, S3, and this means that we play on this row. The columns, so the row is chosen by the defender. The column is chosen by the other player, the attacker. In the end, if one chooses this and the other chooses this, they will end up playing in this point. And so the defender will get a payoff of 30 in this case, because the blue is the payoff of the defender and the attacker will get the payoff of six because the red is the payoff of the attacker. You see, both the blue and the red values depend on the row and the column. That is the choice of the defender and the choice of the attacker. So the dilemma here is, as a defender, which row should I choose if I don't know what the attacker will choose? And as an attacker, the same applies. Which column should I choose if I don't know the row chosen by the defender? Keeping in mind that the attacker wants to maximize the red score and the blue wants to maximize the blue score mm. is not easy. In a competitive zero sum game, the row, the red values are the opposite of the blue values. So in this case, even more, the red player will try to choose columns where the red values are larger, meaning that the blue values are smaller. So in practice, in this case, the choice of the two plays are really made on a different opposite basis. In competitive zero sum games, usually we don't represent both the blue and the red. We usually present one of the two because with only one value, we already know they pay off the blue and the red because one is the opposite of the other. So in this case, keep in mind that the red wants to go where this is small and the other wants to go where this is large. So for instance, the red will choose very likely. So the red wants to maximize. So the red, for instance, will go we like to go here where you have zero or here where you have one, which is the best for him. It so happens that this is also the worst for the attacker because the attacker here, the defender, the defender here is minus one or zero. The defender would like to go here where you have 30 or here where you have 25. But this is something the red does not want. So how do we choose? Hmm. I leave to you to guess what we should do here. Something that is done often in security applications is to decide based on a worst case assumption. So the defender will say, I will choose the row assuming that the red will choose the worst column for me. So I will try to maximize the minimum. So I choose the row where the minimum is maximum. Why? Because I choose a row and then I make a worst case assumption on the red. For instance, if I choose this row in the middle, well, the worst case for me is that the red chooses the second column and I will get two. If I had chosen the third row, in a worst case assumption, I would get zero. So for me, it's better to choose the second row in a worst case assumption. And the red can do the same. 
And the red can also choose the column based on worst case assumption. So what has happened here? If I look at the rows, the middle row is the row where the minimum is maximum. In the first row, the minimum is zero, second row is two, third row, the minimum is zero. Remember, we are looking, when I choose the row, I'm looking at the blue payoff. So I will choose the second row. The red can do the same. The minimum is maximum in the third column. Because in the first column, the minimum is one, in the second is minus three, in the third column is two. So if both player choose a worst case solution, we will end up choosing the second row for the first player and the last row for the red player. And we will end up playing in this yellow cell here, the yellow cell. Now, my sum, what I want to show here is that in this case for the defender, choosing according to worst case assumption is too pessimistic. I could have done better. Why? Let us look at these numbers more carefully. And let us consider the red player. For the red player, the third column is what is called a dominant strategy, a dominant choice. Why? Because in this particular example, if I look at the red payoff, the red player will maximize its payoff by choosing the third column, regardless of what the blue does. Because for each row, the maximum is in the third column. So if the red player, which is a clever, rational player, we see, will for sure choose the third column. No doubt, because he cares about the red payoff. The blue player can know this because this matrix, this table is known to both the blue and the red players. The blue player does not know the move of the red player, but he knows the table, he knows the payoff. So the blue player knows that the red player will play the last column because this is the best possible choice regardless of what the blue does. And so the blue player can adjust his strategies, maximizing the blue payoff, knowing that you're playing in the last column. And the best choice in this case is the first column because this will give a payoff of nine instead of four, which is almost the very maximum possible in the table. So for the blue player, it's not so clever, it's not so wise to play a worst case move, to choose the move based on a worst case assumption. It is better to have a look at the entire table and see that the best possible move for D, no, he knows that the best possible move for S is the last column. This is a dominant strategy. And so I will adjust what I do based on this choice of the red player. This is just an example. But this is an example showing that uh, coming out with the best possible move in a game is not obvious at all. Using heuristic choices based, for instance, on worst case assumption is not the best you can do at all, at least not always. 
Yeah. Yeah. Professor Bernie, I think there is one please. question in the chat box. Uh, please, please ask me. Yeah, I think the uh, question reads like this. Uh, I think one of the participants is asking how we get the table values. Means how is it tabulated? Okay, uh, we. I mean, this depends on the on on, on an application. And first of all, here I am assuming that both players know the table. This kind of game is called a game with perfect knowledge of the table. And it's the easiest form of games. There is an entire branch of the game theory uh, discussing the case of imperfect knowledge of the table, meaning that one of the players does not know exactly the payoff of the other player. I will not consider this here. And then how do we, de how do we define the table? This is very much application dependent. For instance, what I will show later in, in the source of the identification game, what I will say is that uh, for the defender, for instance, uh, the payoff can be minus the error probability. The defender wants to minimize the error probability of a certain detector. So minus PE, is the payoff because then I want to maximize it. Yeah, the so account. can we uh, so can we say it is a, as an example of a min-max problem? Can we give it that analogy? It's like a min-max problem. Is, I mean, very often game theory end up in min-max problems. Okay. Very, very okay. often. Yeah, and uh, the knowledge of the table being there, uh, can it be analogous to uh, something like a white box that we know the uh, playoffs? Yes, I mean, it is a kind of white box, uh, but, but in some applications, knowing the table is pretty obvious. Consider you have, I mean, machine learning. In machine learning, and, and you have a classifier. The defender wants to maximize the accuracy of the network. So he wants to minimize the, the, the error probability. While the attacker wants to maximize the error probability. And then we play a game, where the payoff is the error probability. Yeah, great. This is what I will do, I mean, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, it's clear, it's clear. In other cases, you may consider that certain kinds of errors cost more and others cost less, and then you can have a cost function saying the kind of errors, how much they cost. And so you have costs rather than error probabilities. Hmm? Okay, is this okay? Yeah, it's okay. I think the participant says he's got it. He's, he thanks you for the same. Okay, so we go. So how do we choose? And here, again, there are many, many possibilities. An optimum choice of a pair of strategies A pair of strategies means I've chosen mine, the other party choose its, and in the pair of strategies called a profile, by the way. An optimal choice of a pair of strategies is a kind of choice that in a sense, and what sense I will tell you, in a sense is satisfactory for both parties. Is a kind of choice that this the best that, part, that both parties can do given the ignorance of what the other party does. This optimum choice, which is optimum in a certain sense, is called an equilibrium of the game. So in game theory, the optimum choice made by the two players so the row and the column is called an equilibrium point. And an equilibrium point is in a sense, a satisfactory point for both players. What does it mean satisfactory? Well, here we have many, many possible definitions 
of equilibrium and uh, we secure here have many many possible definitions of equilibrium points and depending on the definitions this equilibrium point is better fit in your application or not the most famous notion of equilibrium is Nash equilibrium uh, this is the equilibrium this is the theory that uh, Nash developed and that gave him the Nobel Prize uh, we say that a profile a pair of choices he is an equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium point if now one of the players has an advantage to change his or her strategy assuming that the other does not change its strategy so s1 and s2 stars are in Nash equilibrium if keeping s s2 as is changing s1 does not improve the point so given s2 s1 star is the best you can do at the same time given s1 star s2 star is the best that the second player can do is a kind of settle point in functional theory so if i choose if i am the first if i choose s1 s1 star then the best that the other can do is S2 star. If the other chooses S2 star, the best I can do is S1 star. This is Nash equilibrium. But it's not the only possible equilibrium. Others are dominance based equilibrium. If, as in the example I gave here, for one of the two players, a dominant strategy exists, that is, if for one of the two players, there is one strategy that is the best you can do regardless of the choice of the other, then this party will choose this strategy. And then the other player can adjust his strategies knowing that the other will play the dominant strategy. So in this sense, this, wow, what did I do? Mm, too bad. Okay, go back here. So in this sense, this choice is an equilibrium point. Why? Because the best A can do is this choice. And at the same time, the best D can do is this choice. So this is really an equilibrium. This is a very strong equilibrium because it's an equilibrium based on dominance. This is called a dominance based equilibrium point. And, and when a dominance based equilibrium point exists, this is usually very strong result in game theory because dominant based equilibria are very strong satisfactory solutions. But dominant equilibrium do not always exist. And then maybe we can go to Nash based equilibrium and many, many others. I, I have no time to go into all possible definitions of equilibrium points because otherwise I would give an entire course on game theory, which is not the case here. But I mean, you have to understand that once I have defined my problem as a game, the solution of the problem means finding the equilibrium of the, of the game. Good. So let me give another example. Steganography and steganalysis. I assume you are familiar with this. So let us start with this point. I am the steganographer and I know that if I embed my hidden message into flat regions of an image, they are more easy to detect. Then what I will do is that I will hide the stego message in textured areas, the leaves of these trees. Good. 
Then let, let us go to the stegonalizer. The stegonalizer, no, is always, sorry, it's always. The stegonalizer knows that the steganographer will hide the message in textual areas. Then he will look for the message only in textual regions because he knows that the other will hide the message in textual regions. Good, but this is not finished because now the steganographer knows that the steganalyzer will look only at textual regions. So I know the detector does not look at flat areas. Then what I will do, I will add the message into flat areas. But then the signalizer knows that I'm gonna hide my message into flat areas. So I look into flat areas and then never end the loop. If one of the two plays first, then maybe we know how to do. But if we, if we don't know, if we go on in this way, we end up in a never ending loop and we don't know what to do. This is a typical example where game theory may help. And in this paper, hmm, shifted here, uh, these researchers studied this problem from a game theoretic perspective. And they came out to, with an equilibrium point where the attacker split the payload between flat and textured areas in a certain percentage. And at the same time, the defender look at both flat and textured areas with different confidence. So the defender will rely more on textured areas, but will also give a look at flat areas to avoid that the attacker will embed everything in flat areas and vice versa. So in this paper, they managed to solve this problem in a game theoretic sense, and then they broke this never ending loop coming out with the equilibrium point of the game. Or maybe I can see, okay. Good. So if you are interested in steganography and steganizers, this paper is very interesting. So what is the basic le lesson I want to give here? Is that security is not robustness. The performance of a system in the presence of a non-rational, non-intelligent attacker like nose addition should be regarded as robustness. While if I want to understand the security of a system, I should define this as a game and the performance at the equilibrium point gives you the security of a certain kind of adversary that is an adversary with a certain sets of possible moves and so these are different so here if i look if, if suppose i have one column for the attacker which is simple noise addition if I have simple noise addition, then the best I can do is maybe D2, and this will give the robustness of the system against noise-like random attack. But if I have in front a clever and intelligent attacker, then he will choose the column trying to make the most possible damage to the system. Then I will try to do my best. Maybe we end up in a certain equilibrium point and the performance here will give you the security of the system. Good. Having another example here eh, to show this clearly. A little bit more mathematical, but not that much. And then we make a break at a certain point. Eh? So suppose I have I'm speaking the language of information theory here now. Suppose you have two Bernoulli sources. That is, you have something that uh, generates sequences of zeros and ones 
where in the first one, the probability of zero is zero nine. And in the second, the probability of zeros is zero five. Good. So the detector observes a very long sequence of zeros and ones, and he wants to understand if this sequence was produced by the source for which the probability is zero nine and the source for which the probability is zero five. This is very easy to do <clears throat> because by the law of larger numbers, the number of ones in the first source will be 90%, while the number of ones in the second source will be 50%. So if I observe a very long sequence, then I can distinguish if this sequence came from the first or the second with very, very high confidence. Good, great. Then suppose that they add some random noise. The source passes through a binary symmetric channel with the error probability equal to zero two. This means that I have my sequence and then I flip 20% of the bits in the sequence. Both in the case of the first source, zero nine, and in the case of the second source, zero five. This is like passing through a binary symmetric channel in digital communication theory. And what you find is that at the output, if you start from the first source, 0, 09 and 0, 01, you can do all the math here, it's simple. In the blue hypothesis, you will end up with uh, sequences of zeros and ones where the ones has a probability of 0, 074 and the zeros, 0, 026. While in the second case, everything is symmetric and you still have sequences in which the zeros and ones are equiprobable. Again, if you observe a very long sequence, you are able to distinguish between the blue and the red with no problem at all, because one will contain 74% of ones and the second will contain 50% of ones. A little bit closer, but still distinguishable. So you can devise a test which is robust against the distortion of zero two. Now suppose you are a clever attacker that can still introduce a distortion of zero two. The attacker does not flip the bits at random. The attacker knows that the first sequence has many more ones and the second has the same number more or less of zeros and ones. So when the attacker flips, he will not flip bits at random. In the first sequence, we'll always turn ones into zeros because he wants to diminish the number of ones. While in the second case, he will always flip zeros into ones because I want the second source to have more ones, to be more similar to the first. And I can flip up to 20% in the first case, up to 20% in the second case, so I will end up with sequences for which the number of zeros and ones is 0, 07. Sorry, the number of ones is, uh, this is 0, 03. The number of ones will always be 0, 07 for both sources and the number of zeros will be always zero, will be 0, 03 for both sources. By flipping the bits intelligently, now I can make the two sources non-distinguishable. Which means that the system is not secure 
against an attacker for which D is zero two. So in the first case, this is exactly the same source, but I can write a test which is robust against a random distortion equal to zero two, but it's not secure against a random distortion of zero two. And this gives a difference between robustness in the first case and security in the second case. Good? Is this clear? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's clear. It's clear. So given this, what I want to do next Today, yeah, but one yeah, but one question here. Uh, why then? Uh, uh, yeah, this robustness is used very loosely in the general sense. Uh, means like whenever we talk about security, we say the any designing of any algorithms, we say it is robust. So is it not a jargon misuse? I, like, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, my my, my thought is the following. As a security expert, I, I've been working in. Uh, in uh, cryptography and uh, watermark and everything, we should talk about security where you have to face with intentional intelligent attacks. So when you have something in front of you and the distortion introduced is thought to make the worst possible damage. While if you're simply not the noise or JPEG compressing, or modifying the image with something random, then this should be robustness. I know that in machine learning and computer vision, they use a completely different terminology. They say that the system is robust against adversarial examples. In my view, this is a misuse of jargon. I mean, this is not the proper way. If you have an image, a cat, and add some random noise, and this is still classified as a cat, the system is robust. If adding noise makes the cat become a dog, the system is not robust. If noise is Gaussian noise random. If I design the noise in a very precise way, so to fool the system, then it's security. Okay? So suppose you have your house and you have, a, and somebody wants to enter your door. If I'm trying to pick up a key at random, this is robustness. If I am a clever thief studying your, uh, your key, your door, and coming out with a very precise key replica to enter your door, this is security. Yeah, so in the mathematical sense, uh, would it be uh, uh, proper to say that whenever this Nash equilibrium has been met? Uh, I, mean, I mean, in mathematical terms, I have security when I, am game, when I have game theory. Okay. When, when I have something in front of me, because, because the idea is that in game theory, the column is chosen by trying to make harm. In robustness, the column is chosen more or less at random. Right. Yeah. So really, game theory, in my view, I mean, this is a very personal view. There are, there are many people that agree with me, others that use a completely different terminology. So, I mean, but I mean, at least uh, in my view, and, and, and there are many people thinking about this in the same way, is that when you have a game, you should you should talk about security, or or maybe I mean you, you, in cryptography, what you do is that I mean even cryptography you can consider this as a game, but it's a very difficult game for the defender. In that case, the attacker plays a second. So the idea is that I choose my strategy. The attacker knows what I did, and try to. Uh, disrupt the system. So the example I gave is uh, a situation where the attacker and the defender plays more or less together. So there is right. no advantage to one of the two. When you, when you want to have very strong security guarantees, then you can assume that you play first, the attacker knows everything, 
but maybe a key. And then uh, uh, this is really a kind of worst case situation because the other plays second still can, can be seen as a particular kind of game where one play first and the other play second. But the one who plays second does not choose a random attack. He tries to do the worst possible attack. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's clear. This clarifies yeah, it's clear. it's clear. It is? So I suggest the following. Now, what I want to do is what I will do today and tomorrow, I will see how this framework can be put at work in a particular case. So uh, together with my, with my collaborators, we developed over the years, a very nice and elegant theory of source ad identification. This is very theoretical. This theory relies on information theory and game theory, but the results are very nice. We, we, we were able to come out with very strong results. So I think it's good to present it today and tomorrow. Uh, this part will be, I mean, mathematical heavy. So forgive me today and tomorrow. After that, I will go to less mathematical things. So uh, everything will be a little bit easier. But so, I mean, I want to spend some time to present these source identification games uh, where the theory can really be put at work in a very nice way. This is not very often the case. I have to alert you. Game theory provides a very elegant and very precise and rigorous way of defining security. The problem is that very often, the set of strategies of the two players is so big, especially the set of strategies for the attacker is so big that it's difficult to solve the game. You can define the game, but solving it, that is find the equilibrium point may be impossible. In that case, game theory give only the framework and then you have to use heuristics to do your best. But at least in the source identification asymptotic, I would say, case, we were able to characterize the game very nicely. And so I think it's worth to present this theory uh, to you uh, today and tomorrow. But now maybe it's time to make a break. Huh? What do you think? Is it okay if we make a 20 minutes break now or more or less? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We could get like uh, possibly take a 20 minute break and again uh, reassemble back. Okay, so we'll come back in 20 minutes from now. Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In the meantime, if you think about some possible questions, you can think about the questions and then we'll try to answer them after the break if you want. Sure. Okay. Yeah, participants, please note it would be a break for 15 to 20 minutes. So we would keep the meeting on and uh, you also are requested to be there. And uh, once Professor Bernie returns, we could resume from uh, the, the class of source identification games from where it starts. Okay, good. <laughs>
Yeah, Professor Bernie, can we resume? I'm here, yes, yes, so. Yeah. Before I start, ju just a question. So since this part will be a little bit more mathematically demanding, what kind of knowledge can I assume about the, the, the audience? Yeah, the audience is diverse. So they would have basics of uh, information theory. Uh, so that and basics of signal processing would be there. So Shannon mm -hmm. and all those things would be known to the audience, but not very, uh, means very high level of mathematics, mathematics would not be known. Mm -hmm. So I, I will allow some information theoretic concepts. I will introduce some new ones. I mean, here in the slides also have the proofs of what I will say. Sometimes I will go through the proofs. Sometimes I will just leave the, the proofs because after this, I will send you the slides, of course. So, I mean, some of the proofs are there. Maybe I will not go through them step by step, but if some interested, they can go through the proofs as well. So how can I send you the slides afterwards, Manish? Uh, yeah, I think we could use a Google Drive later. Uh, we could share that on Google Drive. Then I, I have the participant emails with me. So I'll also put it on Drive and share the drive shareable link. So they could okay. download on their own. Okay. So if, if after this, you send me the, the, the link to where I can upload my slides, sure. I will do it. Day, yeah. day by day, I will upload them. Sure, sure. Okay, good. So we can start. Yes, please, please, please start. Is there anything you want to ask before I go on? No, no. Uh, participants, if there are any questions, you could unmute yourself and ask, or you could also chat, put it in the chat box, and Professor Barney will be happy to reply. Very happy. <laughs> okay, so in the meantime, I, I, I start. So what I will do is that I will... Uh, uh, use game theory to start the source identification games. First, I will motivate what I want to do. And then I will present the games. Today, I will just give some mathematical preliminaries. And tomorrow, I will describe these games, definitions, results, and everything. In addition to being interesting by themselves, these games will also be useful to give an outline of what you should do to analyze the problems in terms of game theory. These are all the steps you need to do. Define the game, define the strategies, find the equilibrium point, evaluate the payoff at the equilibrium. So it will be very clear what you should do in principle to analyze a security problem in terms of game theory. So some motivation, this part is still easy. Huh? So, Source identification, what, the, what could source identification mean? And this is one example. You have a, a camera Y, and uh, this camera took an image of, of a car crash here. And, but then for some reason, I will not stay here to discuss the possible reason, the attacker may want to pretend that this image was taken by another camera, X. I don't know why, but for some reason, he wants to let the analyst think that this was taken, this image was taken by a camera X. So what the attacker can do is to modify the image taken by X, so to produce another image, which is visually similar, and then in such a way that this analyst, when it looks at this image, he should ask the question, does this image come from X? The answer should be no, because the image was generated by Y, but then the attacker wants that the analyst thinks that the image was taken by X. The analyst knows that there is an attacker out there. Good. The, Analysts know the details of camera X, but may not know, or may know, don't know, the details of camera Y. 
So source identification. Again, because I have two players here. Another more recent example, uh, there is uh, again architecture producing a synthetic video. Here we have uh, President, ex-President Obama here. And uh, the attacker wants to claim that this video was not a synthetic one. The attacker claims that this video was taken by a video camera, a real video camera. So what the attacker can do is to modify this video to generate another video, which is visually similar to the original one, but maybe removing the traces of the gun or introducing the traces of the camera here. And so the analyst, when looking at the video, wants to know if this is fake or real, despite the presence of the attacker that may want to let the analysis fail. Again, this is a source identification game. I have two classes of sources, again, and the real camera, and I want to understand if a video was taken by one or the other in the presence of an attacker. Third example, completely different setup here. I have a network and I have a network under attack. There is an attacker applying, I don't know, maybe a denial of service attack. And the analyst can look at the traffic level, so some statistics of the traffic, and he wants to decide if this uh, uh, traffic data comes from a normal network or from a network under attack. And so again, this is a binary decision problem. So is the source a normal network or a network under attack? Well, taking into account that the attacker not only applies the denial of service attack, but he may also reshape the traffic, reshape the attack, so that these features, those features that the analyst uses for his decision are as similar as possible to those of a normal network. So this is what you want to, to solve. And these are these motivation example three. This is the kind of problems we want to solve. And we want to define a general framework for these kind of problems. So uh, in the last 10 years, more or less, less than 10 years, uh, we developed a, a rigorous theoretical framework to study what I will call the source identification problem under adversarial conditions. And we did so putting together three different mathematical uh, disciplines, that is game theory, information theory, and also another surprise, I will talk about this tomorrow, which is optimal transport theory, which is a branch of mathematics that is receiving a lot of attention these days. And in particular, uh, I will talk about three possible games. One, is the source identification game with known sources. What this means? It means that the source Y and the source X are known. We have a statistical model for these two sources. And this is the easiest case, and I will spend most of the time on it because it already gives you the general ideas of, the, of, of what, you, what you want to do. Second, we develop another game, which is the source of the identification game with training data, a situation where the, we do not have a probabilistic model for these two sources, but we can observe some training data from one of two of these sources. So I do not have a model, but I have examples. This is a little bit more similar to what we do in real life where we do not have models of images or even networks, but we only have examples. Third, we also develop an even more complicated game where not only, not only 
the attacker can modify the data at test time. The attacker in this case can only corrupt part of the training data. And so here you have a much more powerful attacker. And this goes uh, a little bit closer to machine learning where the attacker can also interfere with the training phase. I will say very few things about this because I guess that already going through the first example and a little bit of the second game will take us busy the entire day tomorrow. Uh, nevertheless, I will point you to a few things about the corrupted training case and point you to a paper where we study also this uh, situation. Good, okay, this is uh, the agenda for tomorrow. The technical tools that I will need to describe these games are one, game theory, and already told you what I need. Second is some uh, advanced tools of information theory. And statistics. So what I do today in this last hour we have to stay together is that I will give you some preliminaries of this advanced tool that I will need of information theory and statistics. Basically, I will have to present what is called the method of types. The method of types provides a very elegant and innovative way to look at information theory. It, uh, provides a very good bridge between information theory and statistics, but usually is not something that is taught in information theory courses, not often. So we have to give you these, uh, these notions. If you know this, it's better for you. Huh? Now, let us first introduce some basic IT quantities. If you already, had a course on information theory, this will be just a reminder for you. So uh, forgive me if I will say things that you already know. So the basic IT quantities that I will need are given two sources, X and Y. Uh, suppose they are memoryless sources. Today and tomorrow, I will always assume memoryless sources. Uh, the extension to sources with memory of the things that I will say is possible, but very complicated, so I will not deal with it. Memoryless sources means that the sequence of values emitted by the sources are I, I, D. So independent and identical distributed random values. Okay, the two sources have a joint probability mass function, P, X, and Y. And the marginals of these probability mass functions are P, X, and P, Y. So P, X, and P, Y describe the statistics of the two sources and P, X, and Y gives you the joint uh, dependencies between the sources. I guess you know that the entropy of the sources is defined this way where the sum is extended over all the symbols in the alphabet of the source. Good, and log is in base two here. Yeah. Good, I will not spend much time on it, you know what it is. And basically the entropy describes the amount of information produced by the source or the amount of ignorance you have about the source before you observe its output. When you have two sources, you can also define the joint entropy and the conditional entropy of the source. The joint entropy is defined very similarly to the entropy, but now you have a double sum, uh, sum over the Cartesian product of the alphabet of the first and second sources. And it's defined in terms of joint probabilities. 
the joint entropy gives you the amount of information you get when you observe two outputs, one from each source. It's not the sum of the two entropies because the two sources can be dependent. And then we have the conditional entropy defined like this. It's very similar to the joint entropy, but now we have conditioning in the probability in the log. And by this, I mean probability that y is equal to small i given that x is equal to x. Good. Well, the conditional entropy tells you the amount of information you get observing y, assuming that you already know x. Or in other words, how much ignorance you still have on y, assuming you already know x. If x and y are very dependent, knowing x tells you a lot about y, and this conditional entropy will be very small. If x and y are independent, knowing x does not help at all knowing y. So if they are independent, this is equal to h of y. Good, great. Given these quantities, you can also define the motor information, which is defined as the common information, this is big X, common information between X and Y. The information conveyed in common by the two sources. You can consider in this way. The common information is the information given by X minus the information given by X when you know Y. So what remains is the information in X that is common to Y. Because if you remove the information in X that is not in Y from H of X, you obtain the common information. You can do this also the other way around, or you can see this as the sum of the marginal entropies minus the joint entropy. And the formula is like this. You have here the joint distribution and here you have the two marginals. This is the mutual information. It plays a central role in information theory and in digital communications. And I will not use it very much today and tomorrow. In this picture, which is a Venn diagram representation of information theoretic quantities, you can visually uh, represent the relationships between the various quantities. So the pink part can be seen as the entropy of X, while the blue part can be seen as the entropy of Y. Good. They have some information in common, upper part, and the information which is in common is the mutual information. The union of the information given by both X and Y is the joint entropy. This, and when you put together the two sources, the union gives you the entire information given by the two sources. And this includes the information of X, the information of Y minus the common information. Because if you sum the information of X and the information of Y, you are, count, you are counting the mutual information twice. So if you want to have the joint information, you need to have, and you have to remove H of Y, X. In fact, here you have the H, X, Y, is equal to h of x plus 
H of Y, but then you have to remove the mutual information. Otherwise you can't eat twice. And that's where the last formula here comes from. Good. From this picture, you can see very well also the conditional distribution. This part here, is exactly is exactly the amount of information we have in x if you already know why if you know why the blue part is already known so what is remain for you knowing x is h of x given y and in fact you can say that h of x y can be seen as h of y plus h of x given y. The blue part plus the blue part, which is y, plus the x part knowing already y. The same can be applied to the other. So here, this part tells you what remains to know in y assuming that you already know x. x is this part. You already know it. So the common part is already known. And h of y given x is h of y minus the modal information. And if you, if you, I guess you know this Venn diagram, but if you look at this Venn diagram, you can remember quite easily the relationship between uh, these mutual information, these uh, information theoretic quantities, that is mutual information, entropy, joint entropy, and conditional entropy. I will use some of these, not much, but uh, these are the quantities that you usually know. Now let us consider another quantity, which is a little bit less common. That is the divergence or also called the Kullback Leibler distance between two sources. Or equivalently to probability mass function. The Kullback Leibler distance is very much used in machine learning, in statistics, and so I will um, spend a little bit to explain it to you. So suppose you have two. This should be small. Suppose you have two sources with two different probability mass functions, or you can consider these as two random variables, one whose probability mass function is Q of X and one whose probability mass function is P of X. So in practice, you have two probability mass functions. One could be this and another could be this one. You want to define the divergence between the two sources or Equivalently, the Kullback Leibler distance between the two sources. This is sometimes also called relative entropy. By definition, you have the following the Kullback Leibler distance or divergence, I, I prefer the term divergence, between the two sources is d p of x qx usually is indicated without the x inside, and this defined as follows. Sum over all the x, so you assume that the two sources or the two random variables are defined on the same alphabet x, and you sum this. And sum over all the symbols, p of x log p of x divided by q of x. 
This is just the definition. Take it as is. In a sense, in a sense, can be seen this as a distance between probability mass functions. Is a way of measuring the distance between P of X and Q of X. It seems a strange way of computing distances, but we will see that this is very important because it has a very important role in statistics and many other things. Well, I call this distance, but this is not a distance. It does not have the usual properties of distances. It has only two of such properties. It is always positive. And I will, I will prove it later. This is always positive and is equal to zero if and only if the two distributions are equal. In a, a Lebesgue theorem, but I mean, let's say they are equal, okay? It is not symmetric. D P Q is not equal to D Q P. And you see it from the definition. The role of P Q is not the same here. And the triangular inequality does not hold. So it's not a real distance in mathematical terms. You can say that this is a quasi distance. Still, and uh, it's good, it's useful to think about the divergence as a distance. And in fact, it's called kullback Leibler distance. Even is mathematically speaking, is not a distance. It's not even, ob <clears throat> it's not even obvious that it's all, this is always positive. Because if you look at the definition, P of X is always positive. It's a probability. But this ratio can be either larger than one or smaller than one. Because for, for some x, p of x may be larger than q of x, while for some other x's, p of x may be lower than q of x. So this logarithm can be both positive and negative. So it's not even obvious that this sum in the end is always positive. Good. But it is. And in fact, you have the proof here. I can give you this proof very easily. So you have this property of the logarithms. If you have a natural logarithm of Z, this inequality works. This is called Jensen inequality. You can prove it very easily by plotting log X minus one plus one X, whose plot is something like this. Ah, sorry. Hmm. Oh, I'll make it. This is log X minus one plus one. Since this is always positive and equal to zero only for X equal to one, then you have this, this inequality. Using this inequality, you can prove that the divergence is always positive. This is the definition, this is more X. Then I transform the logarithm in base two into logarithm in base E. You only need to put this in front. And then you apply this Jensen's inequality to this. So here you have larger or equal than, instead of a log, have minus one, the inverse of the argument of the log. With this, this is always zero, this is equal to zero because if you take the multiplication, you get sum of X, P of X minus sum of X, Q of X, this is always equal to one because P of X is a, a probability mass function. 
this all is equal to one because Q of X is a probability mass function. And then this is zero. And because of this inequality, the divergence is always positive. And it's equal to zero only when this is equal to one. That is when P of X divided by Q of X is equal to one. That is P equal to Q. So with this simple Jensen's quality, uh, inequality, have proven that both the divergence is always positive and is equal to zero if and only if P is equal to Q. These are basic properties that I will use later. Good, so far so good. Ah, this is also interesting. This is just a curiosity. I will not use this property. If you look at the definition of the modal information, you can see that this is the kullback liber distance between the joint PDF and the product of the marginals. The product of the marginals is the joint probability mass functions of two random variables X and Y that are independent. While when you have this joint distribution, which is not the product, these are dependent. So very nicely, the mutual information can be seen as the cool back library distance between the joint probability mass function of two random variables and the probability mass functions of two independent random variables with the same marginals. This, I found this to be very interesting because the Moodle information can be seen as the callback library distance of the probability mass function you have from two independent random variables. It tells you how far is your joint probability mass function to the case of two independent random variables. I find this to be nice. I, I will not use it. I, I put it here for your curiosity. Questions about divergence? Did you know about this quantity? Maybe yes. For instance, when uh, uh, in machine learning, we, we use a loss based on cross entropy, in the binary case, the cross entropy can be seen as uh, the Kullback library distance between uh, the ideal classifier and uh, the score of your network. So it's really at the basis of many even machine learning tools today. No question? I can go. Yeah, we are doing one particular problem in the second half uh, with regard to this cross entropy, where we are using it as a loss function. So that right. that collab notebook will be shown to the participants uh, with the running with Iris dataset example. Mm -hmm. So we are going so to great. use yeah we are using cross entropy with that. So that's yes, the cross entropy. Yeah, great. It, it derives easily from the Kullback library distance. Yes, right. Okay, right. good. There's a lot of information theory in machine learning. It's hidden, but it's there. Nevertheless, now what I want to do is to introduce you to these uh, new methods in information theory that are called method of types. What is a type? And suppose you have a sequence, Xn. Xn is a sequence of n symbols taken from the alphabet, A1, A2, a1, A1, A3, A4. This is a sequence of symbols taken from an alphabet X. I call empirical probability the probability mass function obtained by considering exactly the relative frequencies of the symbols in the sequence. So mathematically, Pxn of a certain value A is the number of times that A appears in the sequence 
divided by n. Good. So if I have 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 the probability xn of 1 will be 4 divided by 11. And probability xn 0 will be 7 over 11. It is the empirical probability estimated on a sequence. This is the type of the sequence. Now, if I consider a sequence of length n, how many types are possible? This calligraphic pn is the set with all possible empirical probabilities with denominator n. Easier to show than to explain mathematically. So suppose you have a binary alphabet, x and y. And suppose your sequence has length five. How many possible empirical probabilities you may have? Zero, one, if your sequence have, has all zeros. One fifth, four fifth, if your sequence has one zero and four ones. Two fifth, three fifth, if your sequence has two zeros and three ones, and so on and so forth. Since you have only five elements in the sequence, here basically you are considering all fractions with denominator n and uh, integer numerator. And you can have at the most six in this case. Good. The first, then this is a type. And this is the set of all possible types with the denominator n. Now, what is a type class? A type class is the set of all the sequences with the same type. So given a type P, the type class T of P is the set of all possible sequences whose empirical probability is exactly P. Example, consider this type. This type is a probability mass function where you should have the probability of 0, 3 fifth and the probability of 1, 2 fifth. This, for instance, is the type of this particular sequence because the relative frequencies here are exactly Three out of five are zeros, and two out of five are ones. But this is not the only sequence with this type. All the sequences for which you have two ones and three zeros have the same type. And the type class is exactly the set with all the sequences having exactly two ones and three zeros. And then with some combinatorics, you see that these are all possible sequences where you have exactly two ones and three zeros. You have 10 of them in this case. Well, this set here is called the type class having type Three, five, two, five. Cucciolino. So the idea is... Come mai siamo così complicati, amore bello? There's some, somebody speaking Italian here. <laughs> nice. So, here you have that uh, I have defined the empirical probability, a type, and the type class. Good? Now, I will introduce four basic properties, four basic theorems of types and type classes that will be the tools that I will need tomorrow to prove the results of the source identification game. Great. Now, number of types. 
This is a very basic property. Eh? How many types I can have? I've shown you here an example. Eh? Remember here. Here, I told you, I have a binary I have a binary alphabet. The length of the sequence is five. How many possible types do I have? These were all the possible types for a binary alphabet and sequences of length five, six of them. Of course, if the length of the sequence increases, you have more because for instance, and if, if the length of the sequence is six, you would have zero one, one sixth, five sixth, two sixth, four sixth, and one zero. So there are more of them. And even worse, if the alphabet is not binary, and the number of possible combinations increases a lot. So you may ask, given the size of the alphabet, and given the length n, how many possible types, how many possible empirical probabilities may I may have? Seems complicated, but it's not. There is this theorem that says that the number of types with denominator n is upper bounded by this quantity. The proofs is obvious. This is a very loose upper bound. So the idea is that if you have a sequence of length n and the alphabet is of size x, a type is given by x values, f fractions with denominator n and whose sum is equal to one. So for instance, suppose this is equal to four, you have the norm. And then is equal to 10, one tenth, three tenth, four tenth, two tenth. This is one possible type. Another possible type could be three tenth, four tenth, zero tenth, and three tenth. Denominator is always zero. You have four terms to add because the size of the alphabet is four and adding all them together should give you one, because this must be a probability. So how many of these can you build? I will give a very upper bound. So if your denominator is N, you have to set N fractions. Sorry, no, that's wrong. If the size of, of the alphabet is this, you have to set a number of fractions with denominator n, and the number of fractions is the size of the alphabet. Then look at the first. What the dominate, what can the denominator be? It can be zero, one, two, three, up to n. So this can be chosen from zero up to n. What about the second? Well, the number of possible choices for the second depends on what I choose for the first, because the sum must be equal to one. Forget it. Let, I want an upper bound. So even for the second, I can choose from zero to n and for the third and go down to the last. I can choose any value from zero to n. Not all of these are possible because the sum is not equal to one, but this for sure is an upper bound. These are n plus one, these are n plus one, these are n plus one. If you consider all possible combinations, at the most I have n plus one raised to the power cardinality of X. And this is the maximum possible number of types I can build. N plus one power cardinality of X. 
This is a very loose bound. The actual number is much smaller, but we don't care. For the proofs, this will be more than enough. Why? Because this number grows polynomially. with n. When the size of the sequence increases, the number of possible types increases a lot, but not exponentially. It increases polynomially. Maybe a polynomial with a big exponent, if x has a big cardinality, but still is polynomially and not exponentially. Since the number of possible sequences will increase exponentially, this is what I need. Good. First property. Second property. I have a sequence X. A sequence of symbols. And wow, I want the red here. Good. And I have a source with probability mass function equal to Q. Good. So for instance, I have a sequence, which is this one, binary. And I have a source Q for which Q of zero is equal to zero five and Q of one is equal to zero five. How much is the probability that this source will generate exactly this sequence. This is the result. It is Q of X, the probability that the source will produce the sequence X is, is a negative exponential written as follows. Two power minus N, N is the length, entropy, of P of X plus the kullback library distance between P of X and Q. Where P of X is the empirical probability of the sequence. That is the type of the sequence. What does this say? It says that the probability of a sequence of one specific sequence will tend to zero exponentially fast. If you want to bet on one sequence, if the sequence is very long, you will never guess. If your sequence is 1000 bits long, it is basically impossible that you can guess the output of the sequence. Because the probability, the probability that you get exactly that sequence is extremely small. How small exponentially? This depends on two things. The empirical entropy, and this is the important part. The distance between the empirical probability of your sequence and Q. And remember, the divergence is always positive. So the presence of these terms will make your sequence less probable because then you have minus n in front. Good. So we have this HP of X that depends only on the sequence. Don't care about it. But have this other term that depends on the distance between the empirical distribution of your sequence and the probability mass function ruling the source. And this is important. The larger the KL distance from the type of X and Q, the lower the probability. What does this mean? 
Go back to this example. Suppose you have a source for which the probability of zeros and ones are equal. How much is the probability that this source will produce a sequence like this? Very, 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 very small. Why? Because if n is big, by the low large numbers that I will prove in a minute, by the low large numbers, if you have a very long sequence, you will observe more or less the same number of zeros and the same number of ones. The probability that what you get is very different from what you expect will decrease a lot. This particular source here is made of one, two, three, four. Twenty-three elements, and the type. This to be smaller. And the type will be only three ones out of twenty-three, and twenty zeros out of twenty-three. This is very different than one, two, one, two. In fact, you could compute the Kullback ladder distance between this P, X, N, and the Q. And this will be big because they are very different. Well, since they are very different, the probability that Q produces this sequence will be very, very, very small. How small this is given by this term at the exponent. So the larger the KL distance between the sequence, the relative frequencies in the sequence and the source, the lower the probability of observing that sequence. When do you obtain the largest probability? when Q is equal to P of X, because this is equal to zero at this point. And at that point, the probability of a source will be two to minus N at entropy of Q or entropy of P of X, because now they are equal. Okay. And all the sequences will have the same probability if they have the same time because the probability depends only on the type. Mm. Here I have the proof, if you want. It's very simple. This is just some math. It's more important to understand the meaning than the proof, but I will go through the proof uh, very rapidly, if you want. So Q of X is the probability of the sequence. Since the source is memoryless, the probability of the sequence will be the product of the probability of all the symbols, this one. Then I can reshape this, this product differently. I consider all the symbols, I consider the probability of that symbol and I raise it to the power number of times that A is present in X. So suppose you have, three zeros and five ones, the probability of this will be equal to the probability of zero times probability of zero times probability of zero times one, times one, times one, times one, times one. This is how the first is written, but this could also be seen as the probability of zero, three, probability of one, five, which is this writing. The probability of one symbol raised to the number of times this symbol appears in X times probability of the other symbol raised to the power, which is how many times this symbol appears in X. 
by definition, this is equal to n, the, em the empirical probability of x, the definition I gave in the first slide. And then if I remember that q of a is equal to two to the logarithm of q of a, I can put a two as the basis and bring the logarithm at the exponent. At this point, I remove this quantity and I add this quantity, these two are equal. I apply some properties of the logarithm and then this can be written in this way by remembering the, the properties of the logarithm. And by definition, this quantity is H of P and this quantity is the divergence. So this is the proof. It's just for your curiosity. But I mean, since it is simple, I wanted to, to write it. If you need it, you have the slide, you can go through it. I can also give you a homework if you want. So you can have a coin and you have a coin and you have one particular, you toss your coin n times. And then you have one particular sequence where you have half of the times you have tails and the other half of the times you have heads. So this is like head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, 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 head, tail. And the number of H is equal to the number of T. How probable is that you observe this sequence of results if you are using a fair coin where the probability of tail is equal to the probability of head equal to zero five or with a biased coin <clears throat> where head is less probable than tail. You can apply the previous uh, theorem and see that the probability that this sequence is produced by a biased coin is much lower than the probability of a fair coin because of the kullback library distance between this probability and what you observe. You can do the same when you have a coin with one third of heads. In this case, the second will give you a larger probability. The kullback library distance tells you how unlikely is that the low larger numbers is not satisfied in the end. Good. Questions? Otherwise, I'll go to the next property. While you think about questions, I clean the I clean this. Mm -hmm. Taken each by itself, these ideas are not difficult. When you put all together, it's a little bit more difficult. Next property, the size of a type class. I told you, if you go back here, if you remember this, I had this particular type, and here I enumerated all possible sequences with this particular number of ones and zero. This is a type class. And the idea is that how large is, here I had 10 elements, but if N increases, how many I can have? More and more, of course. So this next theorem tells you the size of a type class. How many sequences of a certain type exist? That's not, the exact number is difficult to calculate. What you are interested in here is 
this lower and upper bounds. And, and, and what you see that is interesting here is that if you consider this as a function of n, you will see that the upper bound is two to the n entropy of P. P is the, uh, is the, is the type. And the lower bound is still two to the n h of p, but divided by this quantity. And this quantity is the number of possible types. Now, the upper bound is obvious. The lower bound, you have an exponential divided by a polynomial in n. And we know that exponentials grow much, much, faster than polynomials. And so this part here is the part that uh, uh, is more important, is the important part. And if you look at this, you can write this as follows. This can be written as two to the n, h of p plus, oh, I need more, more space. This can be written as two N H of P plus logarithmic minus, sorry, because this is this part is the denominator. So minus cardinality of x is the exponent, so goes in front, logarithm on of n plus one divided by n. When n goes to infinity, these terms tends to zero because log base two n divided by n tends to zero when n goes to infinity. So this part goes away. And basically what you have is that the lower bound also behaves as an exponential. Two to the n h of p, more or less. So what does this property say? This property says that the size of a type class, the number of elements into a type class grows exponentially with a growing rate equal to the entropy of the type. So this means that T of P is equivalent to two to the n, oh, sorry. It's equivalent to uh -huh. two to the n h of p. It's not equal, but there is an upper bound and the lower bound that at the exponent are the same. T of p grows exponentially fast with growing rate equal to the entropy of the type. Here you have the proof. Take for yourself. I mean, I will not go through the proof, otherwise it takes me too much time. But the proof is easy, you see here. That's three steps for the upper bound. For the lower bound, you need a little bit of algebra. The idea is that you write, you use these combinatorics. So in how many ways you can position a certain number of elements in a sequence of length n. This is what you have. You apply Stirling approximation that works when n is very big. And then with some algebra, you can prove the lower bound. If you want to go to the proof, try it yourself. If you want to go to the proof and you're unable to do it, ask me. And I will, I will be happy to give you the, the formal proof also this lower bound. But here, I will not focus on the proof. Eh? I want to focus on the result. The result is this. 
the, the entropy that the size grows with the entropy. Good. Last theory. How much is the probability of an entire type class? Let's go back to the example. Here. This is a type class. By the second property that I've proven, I can tell you how much is the probability of each of these single sequences. And these probabilities are all equal. But how much is the probability that I receive something in the entire type class? The probability that my sequence Xn belongs, for example, to Tp of X5. The probability that one of these sequences comes is emitted. Well, it doesn't seem easy because on one hand, the probability of each single sequence decreases exponentially. On the other hand, the number of sequences increases exponentially because the size of the type class increases exponentially. So what has happened? This is what happens. This. The probability that the sequence, no, the probability that the source with probability mass function Q produces a sequence one of the many sequences inside the TP can be bounded as follows. Again, we have a lower and an upper bound. Once again, don't care about the proof. The proof is given in the next slide. It's very easy. You can go through it in a minute, but I want to show the meaning. First of all, the probability has an upper bound and the lower bound that at the exponent are equal. The exponent of these bounds is always two to minus n Kullback-Leiber distance. Wow. between P and Q. Who is P? The relative entropy of the sequences in the type class. What is Q? The source that produces the symbol. So at the exponent, you have all of this on the upper part. In the lower part, you have the same exponent divided by a polynomial. Once again, we don't care. These two terms, both the polynomial and the exponent, they both tend to zero very fast. But the rate at which this tends to zero is dominated by the exponential because exponentials grow much faster than polynomials. So what is written here is that by any means, the probability of a type class tends to zero exponentially fast, and the decreasing rate is given by the kullback leiber distance between P and Q. So the very important results, the larger the kullback leiber distance between the type, the empirical entropies of the sequences and the source that produces the sequences, the larger this distance, the smaller the probability. And this probability tends to zero exponentially fast. There is only one case when this probability does not tend to zero. When D is not positive. 
when D is equal to zero. D can never be negative. So the only case where this probability does not tend to zero is when the divergence is zero. And we know that the divergence is zero if and only if P is equal to Q. In that case, this quantity is more or less two to the n minus zero, which is one. This is the low large numbers, if you want. What does it say? If I have a source, consider again the binary source. If I have a source binary for which the zero and the ones are equiprobable, the probability that I receive a sequence in which the number of ones is, don't know, 30%, and the number of zeros is 70%, the probability of getting any one source, any one sequence with such probabilities will be extremely small in the order of 10 to minus n, the kullback library distance between a source with 0307 and the source with 0505. If I take another percentage, again, with this will tend to zero exponentially fast. If I take another, this will tend to zero exponentially fast. There is only one class of sequences for which this probability will not tend to one. Those with exactly the same number of zeros and ones. And so when n increases, I can expect to observe only sequences for which the relative entropy uh, sorry, the empirical entropy for which the type is matched to the source producing the sequence. This is the only possibility you have. And this is the role large numbers in the essence. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I've seen this question um, to, to, to send you the, 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 the slides in advance. And the problem is that I finished these slides yesterday night. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I will send you those of tomorrow in advance. Okay. So let me summarize the proof. I will not give the proof. In summary, in summary. The number of types grows polynomially. You have this bound polynomial. The probability under Q of a sequence X is equal to this quantity. And this probability is very small and depends also on the Kullback library distance between the relative, the empirical entropy of the sequence and the probability mass function of the source. The size of one type class is equal in the exponent to two to the n HP. The size of the type class increases exponentially fast and the increasing rate is equal to the entropy. And the probability of an entire type class is essentially equal to two to minus n, the divergence between P and Q. And so it is vanishingly small when P is different than Q. Again, a summary. Xn, this blue set, is the set with all possible sequences taken from a finite al alphabet X with sides a cardinality of X. By the way, sources with a finite number of symbols, okay? First property, 
I can split this, the set of possible sequences into types. Each types contains sequences for which the number of occurrences of all the symbols is the same. So I can split the set of possible sequences into type T1, T2, T3, T3, N. The number of types is bounded by N plus one to the X. Good. All the sequences in the same type have the same probability. Why? Because the source is memoryless and then the probability depends only on the number of types, times that each symbol appears in a sequence. So all the sequences in a type have the same probability. The size of a type class, so how many sequences I have in one of, of this block is basically two to the N HP. And the collective probability of one type class under a source Q is in the essence two to minus N Kullback library distance between P and Q. So what? In this picture, if you have a source Q, the probability that this source Q will produce a symbol, a sequence in T1 or in Tn or in T3, this probability will always be very, very, very small when n goes to infinity. There will be only one type for which this probability is not very small. And it will be the, the type for which P is equal to Q. And all the probability will go here the probabilities of all the other types will tend to zero exponentially fast, while the probability of the one type whose probability is close to Q will tend to one. And this is the law of large numbers. If you toss a coin one million times, you can be sure that the number of tails and the number of heads will be very close to 50% each. You will never observe a sequence with 300,000 heads and 700,000 tails. No way. This probability is so small that never happens. And these are all large numbers basically. That is one immediate consequence of these properties of the types. Is this picture clear? I mean, all, all I really need tomorrow will be this picture. And for the proofs, I will need these numbers here, the bounds indeed. So if this picture is clear, everything is clear with the number it's also important the number of types is smaller or equal than n plus one to the x. That's it. This is also important. So I guess that, I mean, I remember all the times that I teach these things, students are a bit uh, uh, puzzled at the beginning. You need to digest this a little bit, but it's not uh, incredibly difficult. If you think about it, it's pretty, standard, but the first time I understand is not obvious. I have to say that I cheated a little bit eh? because when I say that the probability of a type class is exactly this, is not true. We have lower and upper bounds. When I say that all the probabilities goes here, 
I'm cheating a little bit. Most of the probabilities goes here. There is a small amount of probability in all the other types. And since the number of types is huge, uh, you could say that some in all these small probabilities, what you get could be something which is not so negligible. So here I'm relying on your intuition. What you find in this picture is not a rigorous proof of the law of larger numbers. A rigorous proof of the law of larger numbers is in the next two slides. I, I will not go through it now. You can, you, you can look at it if you are interested in it. One, two, and three. And the next three slides, you have a rigorous definition, a, rigor, a rigorous proof of the law of larger numbers based on the method of types. But I mean, I'll leave to you if you want to dig a little bit more into the mathematical details. But the intuition is what is needed. And the intuition is here. The intuition is all in this part here. The probability of a type class tends to zero and how fast this tends to zero depends on the kullback library distance. Only if this distance is not zero, this probability, sorry, only if this probability, well, only if the kullback library distance is zero, the error probability, uh, error, the probability is one. So there is only one type possible, a type for which P is equal to Q or very, very, very close to it. That's it. Okay, then we are ready to use tomorrow these ideas to study the sort of identification games. And you will see that by using these properties put in a game theoretic framework will tell you, will give you a nice way to define the source of the identification game to find the equilibrium point, the asymptotic equilibrium point of the game to study the payoff at the equilibrium. And in the end, to understand who between the attacker and the, and the defender will win the game under certain conditions. So I guess for today, this is even too much. I'm here. If you have some questions to ask, and I will send you the slide, and I will also send you the slide, uh, I hope in advance for tomorrow, so that you have the slides of tomorrow's lecture. Yeah. But don't be afraid. This was difficult, tomorrow is difficult, then starting from Wednesday, everything will become easy again. Yeah, I had a small question here with regard please, to the please. types, to the types, uh, so the upper bound and lower bound uh, parts. So can we not uh, think about this as a combinatorial problem, uh, simple NCR? So uh, 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 NCR also would work in this case. Okay, so many of these properties can be seen as combinatorial properties, you're right. Uh, the proof uh, I give here comes from probability. So there is only one proof coming from combinatorics, which is the one using Stirling approximation. All the others can be proven by using combinatorics and Stirling formulas, but using probability theory, the proofs are a little bit simpler. So I tend to use them, but this is very similar to combinatorics. Yes, most of this comes from combinatorics. I want to count the number of sequences. Yeah. And this is great. I mean, uh, if you are passionate about it, I can say that uh, in this, in these four properties here, you already have uh, the source coding theorem of Shen. Because in the source coding theorem, the idea is that if you have a very long sequence, I will observe only sequences for which the type is equal to the uh, probability of the source. All right. the others, I don't care. 
So here I need to care. I mean, basically, since this is the tab that I will observe in source coding, I only need to care about sequences here. I only need to call the sequences in this particular tab. The others will never happen. And how many do I have? Two to the n h of p. So, and, and they are all equiprobable at this point. So how many bits do I need to count all the sequences in a type log of this? That is n h of p divided by n h of p. So if I want to represent the output of a source, I need h of p bits per symbol. The source coding theorem is already here okay. in combinatorics and lower yeah. large numbers. Yeah, I was tempted to ask this because as we saw that there were two zeros out of a string of many ones. So any sort of combinations would work there. So it would be NCR. So I was like, that's what tempted to ask that. Why didn't, isn't it a combinatorial problem? It is, it is very similar. It is very, very similar, yes. Great. I mean, this puts together combinatorics and probability. That is, right. on one hand, you have something that grows very much with combinatorics. Yeah. On the other hand, when a sequence gets very, very, very long, each single probability tends to zero. Sure. Yeah. So you have something going to zero, summed over many, many, many sequences. Right. One grows exponentially. One decreases exponentially. It comes out that the only case where these two matches is when the probability of the source is matched to the, to the number of sequences, uh, to, to, to the elements in the sequence. When this is matched, then the probability goes to one. In all the other cases, you have either too few elements or a too small probability. So this is a way of looking at a source coding theorem and low large numbers as a combination of combinatorics and probabilities. And, and I found this to be very, very elegant. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, participants, if there is any other questions, you could just type in or you could unmute yourself and ask. I think it, we are coming to the end of uh, Professor Bernie's uh, session. Yes, today is finished, yes. Yeah, today's session. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. I think Professor Bernie, you could send me via email also the slides. So what I could do is I could just put it across to the participants via a common folder for tomorrow. Sure. So I think it is done from, I think from uh, the participant side, uh, we could uh, give them slides in advance. And participants, please note that all the slides as well as the uh, Google Colab notebooks, Jupyter notebooks will be shared with you. It's a shareable resource. And it is open source. It is put up in on our GitHub. So we'll be happy to share all our material. So I think with this, uh, so if it is OK, we are uh, ready to thank uh, Professor Bernie. I think it is 1 o'clock at uh, Italy now in the afternoon. Yes, so it is, it's time yeah, for lunch for me. Yeah, it's time for lunch for him. And uh, for us in India, it is uh, snack and tea time. Uh, okay. yeah. Tea time. So, yeah, it's tea time. So we'll take it off for today from Professor Bernie. And it will be uh, uh, my session uh, one hour later. So India time, it would be 6.30, uh, where you, we would start with the collab notebooks. So with this, I, I thank again Professor Bernie. And tomorrow, uh, please, participants, please note, Professor Bernie is, will be starting in the afternoon. So that will be in the evening for us. So he would start at 1 in the afternoon. So that would be around 5.30 this time tomorrow. So there is a slight change in the schedule for tomorrow and day 5. So uh, taking that into account, my session for tomorrow starts in the morning at 9.30 India time. So with this, yeah, with this, we thank Professor Bernie. Sir, namaskar again. As I told you, this is the way in which we greet from India. And you had asked, and how do you greet back? I, I had said that again, you, you also say namaskar. Okay. okay. Yeah. Namaskar. Okay. Yeah, namaskar. So thank bye. you very much. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Goodbye. So participants, we will be... Uh, I will not be leaving the meeting. So the meeting will be on hold. Uh, the recording will stop for this session. And all recordings and all the slides will be shared uh, daily. So with this, I, we are taking a one hour break. So it is around 30 
around in my uh, watch so we will be again assembling back at 6:30 and we will be starting with collab sessions thank you very much
yes good evening to all and welcome to session 2 uh, but this will be my first session for this day day 1 so as i have uh, just told in the uh, earlier session when professor burney was there that we are going to do it together so it will go hand in hand so i am just going through the outline presentation once more so the uh, topic that was covered today was an introduction to serial signal processing along with mathematical preliminaries where professor burney told you about information theoretic perspective some bounds which will be used tomorrow and day after in many security problems so this is what he had told uh, it was basic summary to what he has done today i will talk details about introduction to machine learning because machine in machine learning you are going to use all these concepts which are being used and we are going to do tutorial sessions with the google colab with simple notebooks so we are going to look into <clears throat> classification model cnn architectures then we are going to see simple things so that uh, you will be able to do it on hand so my talk will be uh, this for today but it will be less of slides but it will be more on hands on so we are going to go ahead with uh, uh, opening up colab and just putting some experiments and simple notebooks what exactly it is from beginner point of view we will be starting today tomorrow then uh, as the course progresses we are going to get a little bit uh, expert view of what we are, what has to be told so uh, starting with this as i told earlier also it's this is professor burney which is who is one of the renowned scholars across the world he is known throughout the world this is his research group which interacts with our group here so we have some or the other interaction with regard to many uh, research problems so coming to how we met professor burney was there when i was presenting my student paper at wips 2018 in the month of december at hong kong so there is where we had a meeting and there is where the collaboration started so coming to this this is always i put uh, all the credit goes to my students who have been part of this particular workshop so it is bibash abrant monali sayam smruti ojaswi ayush and jayant so these are the people who helped me do this uh, collab sessions and uh, at uh, means arranging the things putting it on github so majorly these are my students who have done this so all credit goes to them so coming to exactly what exactly uh, we want to do today so what we i have shared my entire screen i hope you are able to see my entire screen so uh, what we want to do today is we want to go ahead with uh, general things like uh, many of you don't know how to simulate these machine learning algorithms so before i go into the algorithmic part we will try to understand what is this colab how do we simulate so gone are the days where we used to have some c c++ kind of environment and we are now in a time where we are now in a uh, collaborative environment where everything is on the cloud so we will try to learn today what are the cloud tools how exactly uh, what are the things which are freely usable so what are the things which require some uh, mode of payment why exactly all those things i'll try to tell you from the research point of view so getting started with google colab just go on your google browser say google colab and make a quick search so you get this so you get this uh, something like this welcome to colab and you open something like this so suppose i have anyway done some colab experiments so it is showing you here suppose you don't uh, you don't know anything about colab so you will you will be just like this so you will have a you will have something like this where you can see welcome to colab and if i am if you are having a, a laptop with you i would recommend open this okay so are you able, like anybody can tell me are you able to see this one of you can tell me whether you are facing any issue with regard to this screen are you able to see this do you want the fonts to be blown up a little bit more or is it visible so could anybody just let me know about that so you could put in the chat box okay it is okay is what i see here so great then we'll go ahead with this so this is uh, welcome to collabs uh, is what is here so this is how it's uh, it starts so here i'll just cancel this table of contents let's go and see what exactly it is so this is on the cloud so when you type this google this collab.research.google.com it is on the cloud so it is not on your machine so on your machine you have a simple browser so a simple uh, browser like whatever we are using now chrome or mozilla or firefox whatever you have that you will use and you will google colab and it will take you to to this particular part where it says welcome to colaboratory 
so co laboratory means this entire thing is on the cloud so now how do we start with this so we could do this we we'll see this is what it says it gives you an introduction what is colab so it allows you to write some programs and the programs are written in this language called python so which where majority of the machine learning and deep learning algorithms are nowadays executed so it is not running on your machine so when we run it it is running on the cloud so all your run time happens on the cloud and it is freely available so you have you don't have to configure anything so you have free access to gpus i'll tell you where the gpus etc are so how do we get started so we get started by writing simple lines of code so in uh, in colab you can just see when you click here see you have two options either you can write code or you can put text so if i say plus code your code uh, block comes up so one of the codes they they have directly put which says seconds in a day so seconds in a day is equal to 24 hours every hour has 60 minutes and every minute has 60 seconds so when you multiply this you get this so if you want to run this you say run cell so this is a small cell in colab which is running and when you do this product so the answer is here below so we since it is run before so it is showing if it is for the first time you are putting it it will run and it will show and now where is this running this is running on the cloud so whatever is being run is run on the cloud so here it gives you a tick mark if there is an error you get a red mark here so the echoes also how much time you took on the cloud and it gives you the answer right so now if you want to put this here you could put now you want to for a day you want to do it for a week there are seven days in a week you want to do this multiply by seven same seconds in a day you see is taken from here the variable name here is seconds in a day and that is taken from here you are plugging it here so when you do this you get that answer so this is quite uh, this is what your colab is right so you can do your machine learning data science everything in this so this is uh, and if you want to uh, uh, say say take examples so of you want to take a gpu then you go to runtime right and you can uh, uh, go to tools runtime and select your gpus so you can change your gpu you can do all those things here so you could run factory etc everything here so this is how uh, it is now let us look at one of the examples here so here uh let us open some uh, notebooks so here if you go down uh, some machine learning notebooks so let us take for example uh retraining an image classifier so i'm just taking an example here we are not going to run this notebook so here you see so run you have it it opens in a new browser so there is an option run in colab so when you run in colab you get the entire path where it is and you look on top it gives you ip y n b right so this ip y n b what it means so here we are going to understand those parts here so here i am putting in my screen on this so here whenever you are trying to put any colab notebook will have this right so it will be i it will be p i p y n b so whenever you see this you have to see that p y this py is for python so here you are going to have a python script so which is going to run just like your c c++ or java so you are going to code your thing in uh, python nb is notebook so this particular part is notebook so all you are going to write notebook so it is as simple as whatever notebooks you are using to write your uh, like any of the notes that you take so it is called I, nb is notebooks and i whatever is written is interactive here interactive means you can put graphs here so interactive so here interactions can be done you can have interactive notebooks so this is what is ip y n b so you should know this when you are going to be, begin with colab sessions so yes it is a python script it's it's a python but it's interactive that you can put you can put many notebooks here you can put all your graphs here you can put so many frames here and it is called notebooks and notebooks you can share with everybody suppose you are four five people working at three different places then you can share the notebook and everybody can contribute at other ends and you can build a notebook so it is built together so notebooks are written together so i do it many times with my students they are putting some part of the code i am plugging in so you are you can share so you can collaborate that's why it is called co 
collaborate right so it is collaboratory laboratory where it is google is giving this uh, for one uh, day whatever you run that simulations will always be available however if you want to uh, if you want to take it to the next day it is not available you can always uh, put it across you can save the graphs uh, on one more part and you can put uh, and you can make a, a, a like a presentation out of it but if you want it to be 3 days 4 days then you should go for the full version of colab where you have to pay some uh, subscription part and you have to take the subscription but majority of the thing per day if you want to run or everything is free so it doesn't matter much so on the free version itself you can take uh, sub you without taking subscription you can run all your programs that's so that is at, at least what we are doing here so this is what it is so with this if you look here what we do here this is what it is so come back to your uh what we are trying here so the name of the file image retraining right then you see that there is ipynv right so here you can go on putting all the uh, lots of code we will go into the code portion a little bit later once we know little bit of machine learning because this will be very difficult at once if i tell i am just starting so if i summarize what i have done till now go make a collab so you know go to a collab as simple as this it starts right and you want to put your own you want to write something here you go here you write text you can write here so here this is just like comment is my you can write first program in colab and you do you write this and it saves here so like this you can put graphs also here so that's why it is called interactive so as you see down you could see there are people who have put graphs also so this graph is copyable so you can just the you can copy this image so you can copy this image and place it anywhere also so this is how we get uh, we get started with our data science or machine learning and the machine learning next goes into deep learning so uh, it is too many things but we have very short time that we have five days with us so i am trying my best to tell you from a broad perspective that let's get started first so in order to understand any program obviously you need to understand some things from the machine learning point of view from pattern recognition point of view so let's go to that so an initial and an hours or i'll try to wind it up uh, around 50 minutes we will try to understand why these classifiers are because uh, going to code and then then telling you there uh, it it becomes little bit tedious what we will try to do we will take a quick introduction to pattern recognition then i will be telling you exactly why we require all this and what are the common things that come across ten, uh, nine out of 10 times you are going to come across these terms so it is better i explain it in a slide form then i will go to collab open some notebooks and show what exactly it is so let's go to today's part what i have planned so this is what is the introduction to uh, pattern recognition here what we are trying to do so many of you will have that uh, we want some books because traditionally we are using we are used to reading books so if you have any issues you can always no doubt internet uh, resources are available but you always if you want books then these are the standard books juda hart then you have this uh, theodoris as well as bishop which are standard in pattern recognition coming to what we want to talk about today so i want to tell you very broadly what is this machine learning why these neural networks are there uh, why how is this important what are common terms like confusion matrix accuracy all those parts so our uh, talk will be basically on all these aspects before i go to my notebooks i want to tell you this because here if you do not understand properly then you will not be able to take it forward so coming to uh, what is this patterns so you see this you here i have given a simple example where uh, it's a common thing that we let us forget all our data science machine learning complex entropy all those things let us put it aside and let us go to simple day to day life things so all of us go and buy some clothes whether it is men's wear or women's wear so here if you could see what i have tried to put I, on the left hand side i have tried to put uh, uh, people or men who are wearing plain shirts and on the right hand side i have put uh, men who are wearing checkered shirts so uh, you see this easily you can say that you can say that these are men or so this is plain uh, shirt pattern and this is checkered plain shirt this uh, shirt patterns why you could say this because you are used to the human eye or computer vision the human eye what we have is the best pattern recognizer so nobody could beat the human eye 
but our task is not human eye our task is to make computers understand or do what humans do which is nothing but machine learning we want machines to tell what humans can do so humans can directly tell these are plain shirts and these are checkered shirts why etc we will try to find out similarly here if you see if you see something like this you will say that these are doors on the left and down they are windows obviously they are may, they may, may be may be made of same material of wood right so some commonality may be their wood but you look at them and you say they are doors and windows so what made you do that right and what if you go here what made you tell these are dogs and these are cats right so when you say i think professor bernie was also telling today about dogs and cats very commonly used example they are with the cat and dog problems are there so you could always say that these are dogs although the dog variety is different so here you see the breeds are different and these are cats again the breeds are different the way the photograph is taken is different but still you can say that these are dogs and these are cats why answer again is that human eye is the best human eye combined with the brain is the best pattern recognition system so here what we want the machines to do we want to the machine to classify these two people as separate so this is plain and this is checkered pattern right so we want the computer or the machine what we call in general to build a boundary so the building a boundary but whatever is shown here with the red mark here is the job of the machine learning algorithm whichever we call it a classifier or whatever we call it later when we go into technicalities of it but from broad point of view i want to build a boundary boundary between plain shirt patterns and checkered plain uh, patterns what do i want to do here similar doors and windows i want to build a boundary between these two similarly here i want to say these are uh, dogs and these are cats so again one now i am talking more technical it is class this is one class so here if you see i have named it as class 1 and this is class 2 where it is a dog and here it is a cat so my job would be i am interested in this boundary i am interested means from the machine learning point of view or from the deep learning point of view i want to build a boundary so i don't want to build a boundary something like this so i don't want a boundary like this saying that the top one is dog and this is cat so obviously if i do this these two people are misclassified they are not dogs they are cats okay so here i want the boundary placement to come here i don't want the boundary to fall here somewhere here so how is it being done that itself is what is what is the job of a machine learning scientist or a data analyst who is trying to build a boundary so everybody uh, with whether it's a classification problem or whenever we go later into regression everybody is trying to build some or the other boundaries right so here what do we need to build a boundary so what did the human eye say here human eye saw that there is no repetition and uh, here also human saw here saw that there is repetition right so how was it repeated so though the color may be same the pattern is repeated after certain in interval here it is homogeneous the pattern doesn't repeat very uh, very frequently here it is not not so it repeats very frequently so here if you take the uh, one of the features as texture texture as a feature so you can say that this is more texture this is less texture so if you use feature as a texture then you can say that class 1 is the plain plain and class 2 is checkered this you can tell so what did you use when you say you when the human eye used the human eye saw the uh, repetition so here on the left hand side to no repetition on the right hand side to repetition this is what it did so coming to the next here there is see here there is texture what it did height and weight so if you find your if you find the width is like this width is like this right this is width and this is the height if you see that this is the height h you see for doors you are going to have height which is going to be larger around 7 feet 6 and 1/2 to 7 feet and width is going to be at this 3 and 1/2 to 4 feet but if you see for a window it is not going to be the same so you going you although there are some windows which are 7 feet but more frequently at our homes we see these are 3 and 1/2 so this length is height is not so this height may be around 3 and 1/2 4 feet maximum width may be same right so width may be same or it may be little bit different so the main boundary which can which we can build to do this separate these two classes will be your features will be your height and width so this height and width will be able to tell what are doors and what are windows similarly here uh, uh, like what we try to do here is with regard to your uh, so what this classifier is trying to do the classifier is trying to build a boundary 
so what are the features it is doing for your first problem it is taking texture of the shirt for the second problem it is taking height on window for the third feature what it is taking so the third one is your this door this uh, your cats and dogs so it is uh, trying to take its ear length it is trying to take its fur it is trying to take its eyes it is trying to take its nose these kind of features it is trying to see, right so skin features height width many more but job is only one so i am taking a simple example of a building a boundary between two classes right class 1 and class 2 binary classification problem so who helps me do this we get the help from the features so here uh, features uh, are there which are being fed and the person who is building the boundary is known as the classifier so the classifier is a person who with the help of the features is going to build a boundary so what are the types of classifier there are innumerable types of classifiers many 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 uh, i think if you go on i think we have 25 to 30 types of classifiers right but what all essentially try to do all essentially try to build a boundary maybe a linear boundary maybe a non linear boundary but their work is to build a boundary so this is what classifier does and how does it try to do the boundary building it tries to extract the features so the features so this is what is your traditional classification so traditional classification takes inputs so you are going to give so need not be images you can also give just length and breadth length and width so you can give the length of the door also and width you don't need to give images you can also give some uh, uh, so financial data so you reliance uh, industries is uh, share price is this much reliance uh, industry share price will be what after these many days so that also the share price changing over time also may be a data so that is why it is called data data analytics so these are being fed as the inputs simple example i have taken here with my earlier parts so what we do here we do extraction of features what are the features which are being extracted height and width in this case it will be domain specific if it is doors it will be height and width if it is the shirt example whatever i have told it will be your reputation if it's cats and dogs it will be stick skin etc here that all that then this once these features are fed to the classifier classifier will go on looking it is just like suppose it is supervised so one of the examples which is more common is supervised how do we make our children learn any uh, uh, like the traditional writing suppose the child wants to write a how do we want how do we make it write a so we make a write 10 times so the person writes a 10 times and on the 11th time we expect that person to write a right so how we are making the training we are going so showing several samples of a we are showing several samples of b like that here we are trying to show several samples of doors several samples of doors so your height and width all will be all will not be same some doors will be around 6 and 1/2 feet 3 and 1/2 feet some doors will be around 7 feet 4 feet right but i will tell the label is door so like this thousands of things i will extract and give classifier goes on seeing what it is being tell being told it is being told that anything above 6.5 and 3.5 is a is necessarily a door it is told 100000 1 lakh times so so when you show something to it uh, new it will tell that this is a door right similarly it is for the window we are going to give as many samples of the window as possible length and width here the features which are extraction is going to take place then classification is going to tell that it's a window so this is a traditional we are not yet into this machine learning deep learning this was what was existent from 90s till around 2005 6 so this was what you have inputs you extract features you feed it to the classifier classifier to give if it is supervised then give as many examples as possible tell that this is door this is door this is door this is window 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 then the classifier learns what classifier learns this boundary so the classifier is knowing about this boundary and classifies this is class 1 this is class 2 so here what happens so here what happens here you see the cat and uh, here you give the cat and uh, dog so you give thousands of inputs of dogs you give thousands of cats extract the color texture so here the, uh, the features are different feature is again domain dependent here the features are different so now the classifier learns the boundary by whatever is being trained it is like your child you are telling the child this is a you are making the child write a 10 times 100 times 1000 times then the child writes again a right so by training the classifier is learning the boundary so the work of the classifier is to learn a boundary here i have taken a very simple example of a cat and a dog but it may be multi class also 
it may be multi class also because we are starting with this pattern recognition that's why i am keeping it thing simple so here we say it's here we say it's a cat okay so coming to this so now see we are, we we trained with thousands of dogs we gave thousands of cats and now what we want uh, obviously whatever is in the training suppose you give this image and told that this person is dog so obviously if you give this to the classifier it will definitely tell it is dog why it has seen this before it has seen this person before that you have labeled it as dog it has seen this so no doubt whatever is given during training these thousands of inputs which are giving during learning this is exchanged many times many people say learning training but if you are going to use it properly so during training time whatever you have you have given if you give the same thing to the classifier classifier closes its eyes and says the correct class right so training because it is it has seen that during training but your job would be to for it to work for the input it has not seen so that is the job which is called testing testing is also loosely referred to as validation though it is not exactly correct but we are starting generally with machine learning so i don't want to put many complex things here let us keep it simple that we want to understand about testing so this test input is for a cat and this input was not present during training it was not present so the classifier has not seen this now what the classifier before the classification feature extraction takes place features are extracted cat features or dog features are extracted and classifier has already seen thousands of dogs and thousands of cats earlier so what does classifier try to do classifier compares it here you it builds a boundary it sees whether it is in the cat class or it is in the it is in the it is in what class dog class so it sees this and here if it gives cat then it is correct classification cat being labeled as cat is correct right so this is exactly correct classifier accuracy is good right so this is what is validation and testing always you are testing inputs should not be shown during training then only you have built a good classifier but if you give if you give inputs which you it, the classifier has seen before so if you give one of these cats right suppose this cat you give here it has already seen this definitely it will tell it is a cat but if you have you should always give something which it has never seen and try to see whether it is predicting correctly or not so if the prediction here so i am writing here prediction so if the prediction here is cat is cat then you are successful here in building a good classifier because this this photo of the cat is not shown but it is still but it is still telling it is a cat so the prediction is right so this is what is testing here right so whenever we want to do this again i am trying to take this cat and dog example and telling you about confusion matrix because confusion matrix uh, is commonly again used in machine learning when we go to colab notebooks you will see confusion matrix that that at that time you should not know what is confusion matrix so many students whenever i explain in my regular classes or take any classes many people have this uh, issue with regard to confusion matrix they really confuse the confusion matrix what exactly it is so what i try to do in my talks wherever i take my talks i try to bring common examples from real life and tell how to write the confusion matrix so the confusion matrix is written like this see the task is recognizing cat so what is your job recognize whether it is cat or not right so here here it is the actual value here it is the actual value means you know that this photograph belong to cat or dog and here you are whatever you have trained you have trained so you would have trained a classifier say svm class many classifiers whatever names i have don't worry about all that now so whatever names i have given classifier svm lin whatever classifiers are there whatever is the output of that see the prediction of that whatever classifier you build the output of that is called prediction that prediction that prediction you are going to write on this side so wherever i have marked this arrow right so it's a two class problem here it is not difficult it's just a two class so let's go now so our task is see what is our task recognizing cat so recognizing cat is our task so if cat is recognized as cat very good na this is tick mark it is called true positive cat recognized as cat your classifier is very good it is a true positive right but it is see the the task is recognizing cat 
recognizing cat right but it tells it's a dog it tells it's a dog right so then it is false negative so see the picture the picture is for a cat but it is telling you are a dog is it a dog answer is no it's not a dog it's a cat so it's a false negative false negative with regard to recognizing cat you have falsely told that cat you are for a dog you are telling it's a cat right so here it is wrong so false negative next so your task is to recognize a dog your uh, task is to recognize a dog you recognized it as a dog very good dog as dog success right but your recognition was for cat so you put it in dog and that is actually a dog so it is a true negative it is true negative see wherever is true there you put a tick mark there you put a tick mark truth always prevails na satyam eva jayate dese right truth if anybody talks false they will not be for long false is always going to go out put that logic here and you say truth so true true so true positive because the recognition was with regard to cat so yes it is positive true negative because exactly my classifier told it is not a cat it's a dog so it's telling that you are not a cat you are a dog so it is correctly telling it's a true negative right but it's a it's see, recognition is cat it should be recognized as a dog but it is putting in the cat class so here it is again wrong false this is not satyamev jayate it is wrong false false it is a dog yes but classifier is telling it is cat it is wrong so it is false positive so wherever i have put x marks is false so either positive or negative that positive or negative is with regard to what is with with regard to this cat recognition problem right so you should not have any doubts with regard to confusion matrix in order to remove all doubts i take this another example here which is more people now will everybody will understand right because all of us are bored seeing this this covid 19 scenario you go for a test right you want to see you are having either you want to travel somewhere or you have some symptoms you go for a test covid 19 test so he says true positive covid positive they say right so you fall in true positive here true positive here right so here see true positive true positive so here yes you had covid test result also told you have covid it is very good it is true positive right so the treatment would be to isolate the person and treat agree okay and of course put it on the put it on the website the etc etc that these many covid positives are there of course let us leave that so that's a true positive right but you say you have covid right a person has this person has covid but it is giving as no covid right it's false negative go back here false negative so what is happening here false negative come so so what will happen he took the test this person took the test came out with with had covid but it gave the false result so what happens community at risk the person may spread the infection to others suppose the person is not wearing a mask right so here community is at risk so this is our example of true positive and false negative correct so the person who went for a test did not have covid it said that you don't have covid then it came as true negative it came as true negative so you are the happiest person here continue but you have to continue mask wearing all these blah blah which we are uh, fed up listening right uh, hand cleansing physical distancing continue doing that true negative so go back here right are we getting this point am i making it clear right so this is true negative but here see the person the person does not have the covid right but shows that it is covid it is false positive it, it suppose it is uh, the person uh, did uh, that this uh, what you call this antigen false positive came right false positive means the person does not have does not have covid but it came as covid positive so so what happens undue stress and that person is put as a punishment of isolation so the person is isolated saying that you have to stay for quarantine or whatever for your in isolation or whatever okay so this is false positive go back here false positive okay 
so what what i'm trying to say here is what i'm trying to emphasize here is please understand this confusion matrix properly uh, you can take this example saying that on you so on your diagonal so you can also think about this from the diagonal point of view on your diagonal whatever is there is good it is telling either the truth here like this whatever is not on your diagonal on your principal diagonal that is false right so either negative or positive depending on what is the recognition problem so confusion matrix is just one line of code in your uh, uh, with regard to your classification when we do notebooks but we should really know what exactly what is a confusion matrix so there is a fun way whichever i also used to because this is very more commonly used so here you can see a man but the doctor is saying that you are pregnant so which is definitely a false positive here you can see that so it is type 1 error technically it is also called type 1 error so here you could see it's a pregnant lady who has a baby bump here but you, the doctor is saying that it is uh, you are not pregnant so it is a false negative so issue comes only with not with true ne true positive or true negative issue comes with this false positive and false negative so they are type 1 error and type 2 error so you should be able to easily side these two error and we should get this as small as possible all our things should always lie in this so that we have good accuracy so with this here so obviously these are all metrics tp means true positive tn means true negative so fn means false negative all this so whenever you do classification you get all these formulas what are these formulas these formulas are nothing but accuracy precision recall f score you can just whenever we go to notebooks i'll show you directly one line of code but you should know what exactly it is what is accuracy what is precision when do we recall so it is nothing but ratio of this you don't need to remember this also tp plus tn everything is there okay if you have any doubts you can always use this you can go to this and see it so let's get more technical now so let's get more technical uh, before i go uh, here do you have anything to ask me at this point please let me know is it okay so you could put me in the chat if it is okay or not okay so i think it is okay so what i try to do is let's get more technical now so let's now uh, go more technical in the sense that uh, though we talk technical here in the earlier slide we will try to be more technical here so though this was all technical here we are going to be more technical so if you extract these features for this problem cat and dog problem if you extract such kind of features what are these from these features color texture shape right so all these if you are uh, if you are extracting these feature then it is called hand crafting this was the machine learning community was using this from around 2000 till 2010 12 so they were using this kind of uh, machine learning where they were trying to use hand crafting means they will see the problem or oh, the problem is door classification or oh, the problem is this cat and dog pro then use color use skin features use texture all that right so if you are doing that then it is called hand crafting so once you handcraft these features you feed it to the classifier and the classifier now is supervised what do you mean by supervised i am giving some 10000 images from dog dataset some 10000 images from dog dataset and i am giving some uh, say 10000 images from cat dataset so it's not one two right i am giving 10000 so it is i am calling it a dataset different varieties of dogs i am giving and you are going to extract all this and i am going to tell that these 10000 label is dog i am going to tell that these people's label is dog and i am going to tell that these people's label is cat i am going to do that right so this if i give a label it comes under the category of supervised learning so it's a supervised classification right so once you do this classifier learns the boundary using the features and a training algorithm so note this so not only features in addition to that you require an algorithm to train it should train it should go across all these images so that is called a training algorithm we'll go about it very shortly and what it says it should say it's a dog it should say is a cat but it is not that easy sometimes some dogs look like cat and some cats look like dog that time there will be some misclassification and you have to measure it misclassification error should be measured so here you should be able to do this 
whatever we were trying to do true positive true negative you should be able to do this and take out accuracy precision recall f score all these measures you have to take out and if you are a researcher obviously you have to put it in your papers etc right so this is how if you are a machine learning uh, industry person then you have to show it for your client and all that so basically you should also measure what is your accuracy from confusion matrix and all these uh, metrics whatever we have done so these are the performance metrics which commonly we are using which is f score recall precision and accuracy and what they are this is just the formula for that okay so what i am trying to say is once we now learn about all this that they are uh, this is how classification takes place here all whatever boundaries we have built so if you go and see here these boundaries whichever we have built were all of this category what is this nice linear line right so nice linear line is there i can directly say like this nice linear line is there i can directly say like this but real life is not linear real life is non linear so uh, linear boundaries do not exist everywhere so here you see for the same problem whatever i have uh, taken door and window classification door and window class it is very simple problem right you only will say that see i i plot width and i plot height so these two features i plot these are some samples of doors and windows so here i have taken around eight samples here i have taken around eight samples so what i show here i show that if if the height is large then this uh, this one belongs to doors this is door because you are having height which is 7 feet here so they are doors and if height is very less here 3 3 and 1/2 4 so these are nothing but your windows so when i plot this i can easily see that they are easily separable by a linear boundary so what i did we put a linear boundary classifier learned it very easy problem you gave it's like going to an exam and getting an easy problem right but real life is not like that we have many times non linear boundaries so we have some sample some doors some rich man made a window which is looking like a door so you are going to have like this okay poor man a person had so so little money that they couldn't do the they couldn't make that good a door and they made it kind of a uh, in the window size so this samples falls here so now how will you make this still it is easier you can make like this you can make you have some space but what will happen if it this goes and falls somewhere here then how will you separate on this it becomes difficulty so here you see this is one of the difficulty your boundary here i am retracing this between the cross mark and the round mark is not easy so here if you see you are going to take a fairly curved boundary which is not linear it is non linear boundary here how does now your classifier will be in difficulty now you are having some samples which are there and some samples which are here so it is a non linear problem now so example is this sea fish and river fish right so sea fish width is very large and weight is very large right and the river fish the uh, the weight is very less and the length of the fish is also small but there are some fishes in rivers which are like sea uh, and some of the fishes in sea which are like river fishes what will happen for those those will get misclassified so what will happen here your confusion matrix will give a lot of errors so obviously if your confusion matrix goes in true positive true all your accuracy will start dropping down so you get this so the problem in real life is you are going to have non linear boundaries you have to take care of non linearities so how do we take care of non linearities so this is one of the examples in which we take care of non linearities here so here as you can see so this is a classical example an xor problem so xor is a gate for those who are not from uh, engineering for them i am telling in simple words so this is the truth table so this is the truth table for xor so here if you see this is the truth table two inputs so x1 and x2 are the inputs and you are going to get o as the output so what i plot i plot this x1 here and i plot this x2 here so here it starts from a 0 0 so here you see it's a 0 0 here it is on the x axis uh, x is 0 uh, x is 1 y is 0 on the y axis y is 0 means uh, here you have a y but your x is 0 and here both are 1 1 so this is one typical example here so let's do this 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 write the xor output so as soon as you write xor 
you write x or z, uh, x or it's different so 0 and 1 are different so it is b so i write that as class b 1 and 0 are different so i write it as class b so these two people belong to one class and this person and this person belong to another class so wherever i have written 0 0 is a 0 is a 1 is b so let us plot it so let us plot so 0 0 here so i have plot using the colors so i can just remove this for if you are getting confused with this i'll just remove this in between wherever i have put yeah so i am removing this marks here now please look at the the colors here whatever is in red so a a is in red so i have put one one sample of a is here one sample of a is here whatever is in blue is b so one sample is here and one sample is here how will you build this bond suppose we want to build this if you want to build you if you write write a line here so if i start my pointer with some other color apart from let me use a yellow color if i want to do this these two classifications are correct right but this will go wrong this is not blue this is red right so any way i want i cannot solve this problem so here this is not a linear boundary it is a non linear boundary so it is not any lines will not help me to do this so here my non linear uh, things have to be applied so how do i solve this i solve this by going one more step so what i try to do here is this is as it is from my earlier table a and b so i brought it as it is so now i try to use two lines so i try to use these lines i try to use this as one line as g1x and now i try to use this as g2x i take the help of two lines and i insert these two lines and now do relative grading i do relative grading so what i do below this line i put a minus so here you see minus and above this line i put plus similarly below this line g2 line i put minus and above this line i put plus now i take go to the points i go at 0 0 i go at 0 see my marking 0 0 see 0 0 is below g1 line so it is below g1 line it is below g2 line below one is minus so here i add minus minus so this is minus and this is minus 0 1 0 1 is here when i go to 0 1 here what happens when i go to 0 1 it is above g1 so it is above g1 so i will get a plus so i put a plus so here plus but it is below g2 it is below g2 so i get a, i should put a minus so i put a minus right now i go to 1 0 1 0 is here it is above g1 so i put plus here i put plus here and again it is below g, g2 so i put minus here then i go to this last point 1 1 it is above g1 it is above g2 both are plus plus so i write plus So what I did, I brought two people to help me. Who are the two people who helped me? G1 and G2 helped me. So instead of doing it here at this level, I tried to use two lines, G1 line and G2 line, and did two passes to solve this problem, right? And what I transformed, see, I transformed this. So if you see this particular part here, so if you look at this, so here I'll just hide this. Uh, put it on top yeah so you see this what happened L minus minus so go back here you go back you got minus minus so it is zero zero plus minus so it is wherever is plus it is one zero plus means one so this is one zero uh, this is plus plus so one one so what i do i transform all these points with plus or minus and i get this this person disappears so this guy who was here this person who is here is disappearing okay so this person has disappeared and what has happened i'll change the color of the ink so i'll make it red here so if you look this person has disappeared because they map to the same person both map to the same person one zero so both of these map to the same person one zero 
and 0 0 as it is no issue 1 1 as it is no issue now instead of having four points i have three points now i can easily draw my boundary my boundary is here but what i did i took the help of these two passes two lines so this is nothing but your neural network what i did so what i tried to do these are my inputs look here these are my inputs what are my inputs this this one these are my inputs xor problem these are my inputs here directly my output was not helping me directly this output was not helping me so what i try to do i try to take the help of these two lines in between i brought someone right so input is not helping me to come to output so i try to do something here which is hidden and in the hidden layer what i have done i have inserted two i have inserted two lines i have inserted two lines and relative to that line relative to the line i have done classification whether it is here or there so here what i try to do input layer output layer in between i bring a hidden layer in between these two lines the help of these two lines is taken it is hidden which will transform and help me in classification so this non linear problem is solved by a concept called perceptron which is the basics for basics for neural network this is the basic for neural network perceptron is the basic so what is the perceptron work the perceptron is to do the non linear transformation and convert it into a linear boundary so it solves this simple zor problem the non linear problem it tries to make it linear and helps me to do get the get the classification so this is derived from our human brain from our dendrites or nucleus whatever is the biology for the brain typically we are not going into that what we are going into that is there are some inputs there are some inputs but it is not helping us to classify as the outputs i am not able to take outputs easily so i take the example of a neuron or a perceptron which is derived from biology which is coming in our brain it our brain also does this non linear mapping it converts non linearity into linearity right so there is a formula which is summation of this it connects everybody followed by the non linearity so here it is we will go into detail when we go and see a perceptron my students have made a gif for all this stuff when we go there but i am just uh, trying to finish the basic part so we'll let's try to look at it from the theoretical angle so from the theoretical angle who has helped me the hidden layer has helped me in the hidden layer what is there in our example we have two lines which are crossing so here that is the person here which is going to help us which is a perceptron and here i am going to get my output okay so this is created from pure math so today also professor bernie was telling about mathematics mathematics is the foundation for engineering okay so it is everything derived from he was talking today about probability i was asking him about combinatorial problem so everything is math so if you are good in math then you are good in your neural networks also so neural network broadly you can think perceptron is a basic foundation for that which does non linearity non linear mapping so all our brains do that's why directly we can if you have seen a person once second time when the person comes we can identify that that is that person so the perceptron in our brain does it okay so neural network example i am just uh, taking some example here this just out of context that i want to make it simple to all the people who are listening to me so what i am trying to do is see what is my inputs here i am taking a simple example that i uh, want to go to movie right so the what is the task the task is that uh, let me take this uh, example here with an uh, with a different color so my task my inputs are x1 x2 x3 right and my output is i i have some output so here i want to go for the uh, is i want to go to see a movie is my output this is what i want to do i want to go to see a movie now i am going to see the condition if the weather is good weather is bad okay so whether it is good weather or bad weather whether public transport is available yes or no whether i have friends or family yes or no companions right based on that i will make the decision so what i try to do see the possibility here the possibility here is ideal condition that weather is good right so x is 1 so here you see so i have just uh, x1 w1 plus x2 w2 the formula is like this 
x1 w1 x1 w2 x2 w3 x3 is the simple summation multiplication two only two things are there sum sum is there here uh, weighted sum is there then i am going to threshold that i am going to tell you later so let's see the first w1 x1 w2 x2 w3 x3 right so my weather is good so my uh, this is i give more weight everything is 1 1 1 i am having public transport available with me yes good then i am having some family member available with me yes one all one so it's an ideal condition to go to a movie everything is conducive so i give more weight so i give more weight here so this w i'll give equal weight here w w w so here it is 6 6 so 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 what i do suppose i keep a threshold 3 that if it is beyond 3 only i will go to see movie this is a pass here why because 6 is greater than 3 is greater than 3 so this is a pass so this is a pass so what happens here so what happens here you will go and see the movie come to the possibility second possibility possibility b no public transport suppose you may face difficulty in going to a movie there is no public transport okay so what happens you have a good weather but you do not have a public transport but you have some companion right so you give more weight here you give more weight here okay you this is zero of course because you don't have public transport right no public transport so the answer here is 4 4 is obviously greater than 3 although you do not have public transport but still you have good weather and you have some companion you will go right let's go to the third possibility here no public transport bad weather okay but companion is there so what is going to happen two places you are going to get zeros and we had plugged in 2 for this ideal case so we put 2 so you get 2 which is not greater than 3 so your output will be no you will say no for third possibility you will say no so this is what your classifier is trying to do your neural network is trying to do i have taken some values some values i have taken some so but these are these are technically known as weights so technically known as weights w e i g h t weight these are known as weights okay and this is known as inputs x1 x2 x2 and this is known as output threshold so if it is greater than threshold you have to keep a threshold how to select the threshold it all depends on what problem you are using so this is what is the neural network right so uh, no bias i will go to a little bit later uh, you will not be able to understand now so this is what is your neural network structure so what is your neural network structure whatever are your inputs multiply them with the weights and sum it this is what you are going to do then put a non linear thresholding function and get your output and get your output this is what your neural network does so this is what it does and this itself is feed forward so if you look this is a gif that i have used okay so here from the input layer go to the hidden layer hidden layer does all this computation does this summit and this threshold many examples i have given xor i have given going to a movie i have given right then you will turn the output if you made some mistake if you made some mistake during the training come back update the weight in the hidden layer so information flows in the forward direction so information flows in the forward direction so it is called feed forward neural network feed forward neural network okay so this is a common example that we are using for feed for all neural networks so common commonly used uh, this is this data set so this i am going to take today just now we are going to take some example so this particular uh, is taken from mnist data set i'll tell you what exactly m i m n i s t mnist data set which is a character data set from 0 to 9 so from 0 to 9 they are characters written in different ways and they are used for doing the training so zero c zero is not written in one way zero is written in different ways so if you feed your neural network and tell that uh, training algorithm that this is how zero is the training algorithm will learn it feed forward network will learn it okay so this is how your feed forward works feed the network zeros ones cats dogs doors windows shirts right find out do the hidden layer one hidden layer example i have told but there may be several hidden layers it depends on the complexity of the network so go on doing the training 
go on uh, predicting whether it is okay or not threshold sum and threshold come out then if there is any loss calculate the loss back propagate the weights do the weight adjustment so you would have typically one question will come from you i know that you will say sir uh, how did you uh, select these weights how did you select this uh, weight you put weight at some place you put two at some place you put three at some place you put one right how you chose this weight how you chose this weight this is not chosen randomly this is chosen via the algorithm this way i'll go forward i'll do my hidden layer hidden layer computation go outside see how much loss if loss is very large it is not the correct answer then i will come back i will change my weights adjust it see adjust all weights to reduce the loss then again make a forward pass go through the hidden layers again go calculate the loss function come back back pro adjust all the weights to reduce the loss till you the loss becomes very minimal that time your network is trained and it is ready and once it is ready you can give it any inputs it will tell you the correct answer and if it tells the correct answer correctly then it is a good classifier it is a very good and this thing whatever is this this thing is called back propagation this is the training algorithm for any neural network so this is training algorithm this is the training algorithm we'll go into all that training algorithm how the loss function etc week so the, the most frequently thing used back propagation training algorithm so how do you do this just mathematics of this i have shown a example i have shown you uh, this gif a nice this slide way i have shown just to finish it i am just telling i initialize all the weights with some random values so you may also ask me sir how do you decide so i'll just put 1 1 1 1 everywhere W one one, W two, W three, W four, W five. Like that, I'll put one. Then I will say start the training. Then I will calculate the loss. One of the loss function is mean square error. I will check how much is the error. See if the error is very large, right? Then what I should do? I should do some correction. You take an example that you have learned shooting. So you have a target shooting or with, uh, like putting the die. So you have made a target and you are throwing this or you are shooting at that. first time you make mistake you see that it goes uh, three circles outside then what you say i have made a mistake so you tilt your hand like this little bit down and go and say now i'll hit second time you may make less mistake so that error is called mean square error whatever is the target whatever is the target and whatever you are getting actual take the difference take uh, uh, that difference mean square error right square error square that and then you submit this and one over n so i think i have missed square means square should be square okay square error this so this one over n average it out and then go on change so when your mean square error is very less your network is ready so see where when you have to stop you have to stop till mean square error is below a threshold very small so once your uh, this is ready trained and ready you can just stop and now you can give unseen inputs to the to your so you can see this now again so what i see here you are giving some inputs random right hidden layer does it output layer calculates mean square error loss then you say loss is large go back adjust your weights change it see whether your error is less or not continue this process till your error becomes very small and the time where your error became very small your neural network is ready to classify unknown inputs right so unknown cat it can tell that this is a cat so this is what is the uh, broad view so i am just coming to the end as i told you that i'll just spend around 50 55 minutes not more means nearing to that so application of pattern recognition i think dr bernie is also talking about this trend analysis biometric devices vision e commerce so exploring security in all that this is broad things i'll not go into this so phases in the uh, pattern recognition is you have lot of inputs this is important because you here you are going to have lot of inputs right then you are going to sense it segment it extract features i think we have talked about this you are going to do classification you are going to do post processing then you are going to say decision what is a decision your decision might be door or door or window right 
door window classification your decision might be dog and cat right your decision might be dog and cat whatever is your problem domain problem dog or cat so like this this is your decision so this is what is the phases in pattern recognition right many of us have done many things so i am not going into sentiment analysis and all that stuff so but here what are the uh, tools i am going to talk about this because we are going to use this in our notebooks so what are the tools used for pattern recognition in machine learning so there are nowadays see whatever i would have told i would have taken an hours time to explain you simple things but many people have contributed freely <clears throat> so all these are available as libraries so tensorflow is one of the common libraries which we use tensorflow right then there is another uh, li common library pytorch then there is another uh, library kf then there is keras like this there are many tiano built by different research groups and believe me today if machine learning is whatever so popular it is because of these libraries so even if i want to find out any confusion matrix i don't need to write large amount of code so when i was doing my phd we were writing lot amount of code because even to find out one uh, one uh, uh, this confusion matrix i had to write a page of code but now when i see my students just calling the library confusion mat give the target and give the problem it it gives you the results only they need to call that library and use it so many of the machine learning uh, tasks have become easier because of all these libraries they are freely available it is easily available you don't need to write you don't need to write large amount of code but yes you should know how to use it you should know how to use it that's what we are going to do how to get started how to change para so with this i think i am uh, this this we won't go this i give this talk at other places so i am going to uh, conclude this that this is what we did uh, my this is my concluding notes we understood what about our patterns so here we took many common patterns we learned what is training with dogs cats door windows etc etc i gave you some layman examples for confusion matrix and other accuracy f1 f2 all that stuff i showed you what is the neural network from our brain then i showed you a perceptron a non linear problem unlimited i uh, the applications are unlimited in this course we are looking after security applications for machine learning but the applications are really unlimited so with this i think i am ending it here with regard to my so called this presentation so that we quickly go to the uh, we go to the uh, the other part but before that i would like to open it i'll uh, stop sharing so i'll just stop share and open up for any discussion you have or you want to ask me because any interactions i can see few things on the chat uh, okay. so i think i'm uh, some uh, some some higher questions i can take uh, a little bit later so i think is is it okay whatever has been told till now yeah uh, okay so this is see what i i'll tell you before we go uh, the philosophy of what i am trying to do here the philosophy is that we want to be as uh, uh, easy it is to to make the course as easy as possible so i have not put many mathematics here or i am not telling very complex things here because if i start doing that then it will be it may go above your head right so that's why i am keeping it to a beginners level so that you understand basic parts and of course when we have you know basics you can build upon the basics so with this i think without taking much time here i will go start with my notebooks because today's plan that i have i will go till 9 i don't require a break so i'll easily go up till 9 o'clock 8:45 i'll go easily let's see how good we go so now the task what is our task our task is to start with simple problems and uh, i will also tell you few things about machine learning for every one group at nit raurkela what we do so currently i am heading that group it's a student body uh, where they do day and night machine learning they do and not only one in my field they do in every field they do in natural language processing they do kaggle they go, go in hackathons so i think the group is i think around 80 to 90 students who are a part of uh, the institute 
majorly are working outside the institute now because of this uh, current situation what we are in but the, in all the uh, hackathons and representing nit raurkela and so i am heading that group from past one and a half to two years uh, uh, that particular group was founded by uh, this final year now they are in final year but now they have passed on the baton to the next years and they are continuing it so my term is my i am into the second year of heading this group so i'd ask them this time that you leave me because i am already head computer center just leave me but they are saying that no you be there we you will be there it's good so that's what feedback i think few of my students are also here i can see few of them uh, who are uh, put me a message that they are able to hear and many of them are listening from youtube also so here i think we'll go into some parts which are free see there are two three aspects to education so i want to talk about this for just 5 minutes see uh, education is one is a service to the community of students where we do service yes we are tough with some with, uh, with all the student that we tell that you have to do good work but we are doing it from the angle that they should learn right so that's how the education is and it is not commercial in my lab or whoever i work with the machine learning group every workshop every whatever invited talks are kept uh, uh, closed it means it's not op- uh, closed to anybody it is open to all of this people and they can readily easily see the uh, and participate all our codes are online our github repository is online then whenever there is any invited talks we don't keep any fees of course gyan we have kept the fees because it's a formal mhrd based this so there is but majority of the parts and we keep very nominal so that only students who are uh, it is easy for them to pay and come we don't uh, reach a charge even these courses whichever go on for machine learning i see that they are making some 4000 5000 8000 fees for eight days and i i see that lot of money is being minted out of this but at nit raurkela and especially my research group we have tried to as well as ml for e we have tried to keep it open as well as we don't uh, we if we charge also it is just token amount that we do it and not for commercialization purpose so whatever you are learning all my research group material my codes my student codes whoever does whoever student works with me towards an mtech or a btech or a phd are permitted are been requested to put their code online in github so that all of the people can use reuse that code because paper should be reusable so i'll talk about these aspects now and we'll start our things here so i'll just stop my video and we'll go into
yeah so here the target is to classify a given the to classify a given flower into one of the three species so this is my target so i bring my highlighter pen here so this is my class the example here is to do simple classification so i start very simple so three types of flowers are there so these are the names of the flowers iris versicolor iris citosa and iris virginica so these are the uh, flowers which need to be classified they are available as iris flower data set so what are the features you could see here sepal this is the sepal so this is this part of the flower which is called a sepal and this is the petal so this is the petal so if you look at this you can easily see that the length of the, and the sepal and the petal is different for different flowers so it is easily visible that this is very broad sepal and petal and here you could see setosa here it is very narrow and here it is slightly different structure what we have okay so here th this is what is our observation and what we are we trying to do so we we'll, what we are trying to do is we want to classify them so how do we classify we require features that i have told you in our in my thing whatever what are our features so our features are the sepal and petal just like your doors and windows sepal length in centimeter sepal width then the petal width length then the petal width then what it is it is a three class classification look this is versicolor is one class setosa is one more class virginica is one more class so it is three class so if it is setosa the target is zero so you are going to say if it is setosa you are going to name this as class zero come back so if it is versicolor target is 1 so here you go right versi color target is 1 so obviously virginica will be target number 2 target number 2 are we getting this so this is how your so this is how your three classes are so this is few rows of the data set i have shown with the feature values so now you are going to train them now we are going to train them using this feature length these are your features what are your features so here whatever is your this are your features so these are your features which we are going to give features and you are going to have this target target means class label class it's a machine learning algorithm so it requires a label please understand that we cannot have english names here so we have to do the mapping that zero means setosa one means versi color right two means virginica we have to do that machine doesn't know of that so class label so this is the target and this is the english name of it this is the name of the flower so this is our task so i think this is what we want to do here okay so let's let's go to this and let's go back here i'll discard the annotation let's go to our uh, github so here uh i am opening this non ensemble here i open so i'll run this in colab for you so here i will uh so i'll take this we will open here so i am going to github so here i am going to github so here i try to put my group's name then i get a so this is what i get
see you have opened i have opened the classification of iris flower data set are you able to see all of you please you could just tell me yeah are you able to see this everyone yes great okay so this is how it is so let us understand this data set i have shown you on my slide same thing i have put here okay you we'll see when i say i have put here it is my students huh? so they are the people who have designed the notebook so my students have done all this so that's why i gave the credit to my students here so they have prepared this so there are the three colors here so i just reduce uh, here so that we can see the entire notebook so these are the three types okay so now what we do we start our program here so i just increase the font see how we start import so there are these libraries i was telling you about libraries in there are many libraries which i showed you on the last slide they are we are going to directly import them so import pandas as pd imports uh, this import numpy as np import uh, this uh, uh, data sets which are directly available you can also take it from google drive <coughs> you can take from you can import from sk learn the model selection all your classifiers are ready you can also display it graphics so we have to just execute by using this import just you have to say import so i say run away run so you see this starts running these are simple notebooks so i am running them when we go in day 2 day 3 day 4 our notebooks get little bit difficult to run so i i am going to show only the github part of this this is not taking much time so i'll be able to execute okay so i am putting here import panda so it is done load the data see the data set is there iris data set you have to it is where it is it is in this data set you have to use the load command so all these commands are available directly you have to use no need of writing anything right and you have to display this so what i do i load the data so this is the loading part of the data and please note i will be giving all these uh, these particular notebooks to you to experiment at the end of the course at the end of the day i will be giving you the links so that you can go and practice all these notebooks so here i have loaded the data so this is the data here few rows i am showing this is flower number 142 82nd 135th 26 32 data frame these are the features and this is the class where it belongs to this is the class where it belongs so i am just showing you five values so if you want to show more just increase this it will show you more values so i am just giving you demo so i am just showing you uh, five values now let's create a feature matrix because finally we have to feed the features to the classifier please see my ppt whatever i have explained you have to give the features what are the features length of the petal length of the sepal whatever i showed you so i am just running this so it's a data set made up of 150 exam 150 uh, uh, samples are there so 150 samples three class problem it is so there are 150 samples so i did i put the features now here now we have to do training so i have told you earlier also what is training training means we are going to tell the classifier which uh, which is this versi color which is this part, part which is that part that is what we are trying to tell so we have to do training and when we do training we have to give as many training examples as possible so the thumb rule in machine learning is typically your training size should be large obviously na see when you are making your children write what you are making them how do you write them a b c daily you tell uh, write 10 times 15 times 30 times 100 times like that you are telling daily so training is more and after training you are telling you want to take test you say you write c and show so many times they write instead of writing c they write c like this so are we making this point see apply your common life example to machine learning machine learning will not be difficult right but if you apply think if you put a notion that machine learning is very difficult so many commands to remember then it is going to be difficult make it simple so let's try to make it simple let's put uh, as many training examples as possible so here how many samples we have 150 so typically thumb rule so see my thumb thumb rule is 80% of the data you should give for training 
because as much if you give 90 90 it is good but if you give 30% it will not learn properly if you practice your son or daughter with less amount of abc they will make mistakes here you are training a model training a classifier so give as many as possible so use 80% of data for training and whichever you did not give for training keep it separate because that you are going to use for testing or else what is the use if you give 100% in training it, your uh, classifier has seen all the data it has seen all the data so keep it separate so the thumb rule is 80 20 80 for training 20 for testing so we split this data set so you see here we split the data set so you use 80 20% for testing 80% for training the model so what we do so train and test so we run this so we here you see 120 is train 120 is train okay four features are there petal width petal width sepal length sepal width that one right test give 30 per total 120 30 150 so 120 samples use for training and you use uh, rest of the training which you have not given for testing so this is the thumb rule okay let's come to now our data is ready data is ready now which classifier to use please come back to my slide whatever i did you are had a data inputs you had a you had your data after your inputs you are going to extract feature what are the features here in this case sepal length sepal width petal length petal width four features now you also told out of 150 120 training 30 testing so that also you did 80 20 ratio you did now you have to feed to the classifier see classifier is not very important here we can experiment and see which classifier will use so let us go and start using the simplest classifier decision tree okay so this is the decision tree so now i am coming to my third step inputs are ready right features are ready train test i have done separation now i have to feed them to the classifier so that the classifier learns the boundary i have to do training right so i first use decision tree so what is a decision tree decision tree is just like your if else loop if greater than this much then that much right if not then this much so it is just like your ladder decision tree is a simple ladder network right which you will test sepal length greater than that then petal length is less than this then the less than that then more than that then says this varicosa or this uh, centosa that is what you are going to show still so this is a decision tree so you are going to use decision tree so let us create the decision tree here see so easy it is tree dot decision tree classifier you don't need to write the code for decision tree please note what i am trying to say so you don't need to write see earlier days if there are some older people here who are listening to me right so those who have done phd in uh, 2000 late 2000 like me right early uh, after 29 2009 8 like that we are writing so long codes but now these all are available in library i only need to write tree dot decision tree only then it is already there copy this from somewhere put it here right then fit it train and test train and test so i am just doing this train and test so this is training since it is only 130 samples it doesn't take much time but when we go into thousands and lakhs and millions it takes time okay so this is what we do so this is what we do this now let us test now let's test this we are going to predict some samples we did training using decision tree now we will test using the on the sample so what we took so we took actual value of sphere 10th example is versi color this is training i am i am doing so it gives versi color so my training is okay okay 20th was versi color then it is again versi color training is okay then my uh, 30th was uh, virginica or it is virginica it is okay okay so my training is over so let's uh, do some testing let's score model score let's test the score so what we do we test the accuracy of the model on the test set okay we got 90 see 0.96 means 96% accuracy with this it's an easier it's a easy problem so we will not take much thing let's visualize this so we got 96 on the test set we got 96.66 means 96 times it will tell correct answers 96 time per 0.6% time it will tell the correct answer 
Okay, only 100 minus 96.6 time it will tell the wrong answer. So let's visualize this decision tree how it looks. So let's put this visualization here. So this is how it looks. I am just putting this a little bit later so that it looks in a proper way. So I am coming to the next. I'll put a graphics of this. What it did. So this, how it started. Petal width feature less than 0.8, right? Sample 120. Value is equal to Virginica. If it is not Virginica, then it will go to Setosa. So you go down. This is a decision tree. If it is true, then it will go here. It will go to Setosa. So these samples belong to Setosa. Then you see it will check the petal width. Then it will say it is Virginica. Here also it is not sure. Whenever it is not sure, again it will divide itself. Again it will, here it is sure it is closed. Easiest, Setosa is the easiest. Here it is not clear. Again it will, it will divide amongst itself. So it may be Versicolor or it may be Virginica amongst these two. So it will test the next feature. Like a case statement, it will go again here. Right, again it will go split this. This it did, everything it did. I'm just visualizing this, okay? So finally it will tell Virginica or Versicolor with all this testing. So you look, I'm just reducing the size here. I'm just reducing the size here. This is what it did, decision tree. So decision tree, whatever I wrote, gave me 96.6% accuracy. And how long, how big code I wrote? I did not write big code. Here only I wrote to just show you the visualization. I had to write something. But if you see train and test, I just brought my, I just brought my classifier directly from the library. See here, decision tree classifier directly. Train and test, train, train. Then I tested the model, right? It's not difficult. So I finished decision tree, assume. But what is decision tree, you should know. Okay, as a ML engineer, you should know what is a decision tree. So now let's let's come, uh, my, my decision tree is over. Like decision tree, there is another called logistic regression. It's again a classifier. There are many, 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 many classifiers. Logistic regression, decision tree, support vector machine, you would have come across all this. But they are not difficult. They are not difficult as, as long as you learn machine learning from understanding point. Right? So let's see what is logistic regression. So what is logistic regression here? So I just, I think I have on my collab here. So I just give you the idea here because there are a lot of code is there. So this is my decision tree, what I told. So here, what it did. Here it checked for sepal length, etc., etc. After that, what it came here, here it was Setosa was directly able to tell. But it, in between other two people, it was not able to see. So it went here, here and here. Again, it took, broke it. So at the leaf node, it told the class. At the leaf node, it told the class. Okay. So then it gave its decision. And when we tested, it gave 96 or whatever accuracy. Accuracy is not important. Right. Next, what is this logistic regression? Logistic regression is nothing but a yes tape. It is like a yes shape. So it is again nonlinear. It is again nonlinear. So it is going to help us classify between two samples, build a boundary. So everything, what classifier does, you should close your eyes and say it builds a boundary. Builds a boundary based on features, right? So this is what it does. So what does logistic regression do? It builds a boundary like this, separates these two features, top and bottom. Right. So let's let's do now the logistic regression here. Let's come back to our notebook. So I'm coming back to my notebook here. So logistic regression. So this same curve is shown by my student here. So I have put that another one. So he's shown here. Let's train it. See here. From the library sklearn. I'll increase the font. From library sklearn linear model import logistic regression. So nice. I was just thinking whether I can do PhD again, right? So nice. Now just import logistic regression. It comes. I don't need to write my code anything. So from from which library? But of course I should know all this. I should study all the PDFs and all that. I should know that it's from in this, right? And I have to fit it and predict and do prediction. What does the classifier do? Only it does two things. It it builds boundary with the help of features. And after building the boundary, what it should do? All of you know, you only will tell me, sir, after building the boundary using the feature, it will do prediction. What prediction it will do? 
cat dog door this 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 all that right it it gives a prediction so it should predict so here is the prediction so let's learn this let's use the second for the same problem let's use the second classifier logistic regression classifier okay so so this is what you get and let's again uh, import it and run this again you are getting 96% accuracy okay you want to display the confusion matrix whatever confusion matrix see here so nice import confusion matrix from this sk learn matrix import confusion underscore matrix matrix and uh, and what you will give the matrix two things you i have shown you here actual actual here prediction so this is actual whatever i am showing is test whatever you want to test you know now what you want to test you know because you are having the labels with you and whatever you want to predict on top it is predict over if there is misclassification it will give so you see here 11 is here so i'll increase confusion matrix 11 is here 12 one misclassification has taken place one misclassification has taken place right obviously that's why it is 96.66 that's why it is 96.66 okay here there is no misclassification all six samples are whatever taken in the test set are you change your test set bring more test data try again you have to give here and you change your uh, test predictions okay so now we are in the point where we have learned two things decision tree classifier and and next one is logistic regression both give the same answer reason is your data set is very small the reason for taking data set very small is when i run like this na if i take uh, millions or thousands of data set it will show running 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 my will not be able to finish our our class so that's why i have taken small small data set small easy easy things i have taken but i will also show you difficult things as we go ahead we'll show you difficult things but what i want to put across to you all of you is who are listening to me is that okay do do test it do try it you are having lot of online availability lot of books availability etc and believe me here i am again trying to reiterate right so in the machine learning community lot in the training courses lot of people do lot of money by showing simple things right and as opposed to that what we are doing we are doing service here right free of cost we we give all our notebooks free our github things are free why we want to make this machine learning as popular as possible take it out out of the commercialization and make education as a service so that's the motivation behind making this particular things as simple as possible i think this is the fourth or fifth workshop that we are doing on machine learning this is being done as per gyan but before this also our group has done lot of machine learning courses where we have had lot of things which we have given free distributed it free. so now we summarize here we do two things now still important thing is there we'll go here okay we finished with logistic logistic regression if you want to know what logistic regression is simple it is nothing but a classifier and classifier builds boundary for prediction using features this much you should close i am repeating again and again you will close your eyes and see okay now let's come to the svm support vector machine you would have heard lot of people i used svm i did this i did the so many things they are saying but they many of the people don't know what is a support vector machine right support vector machine is again a classifier so if you generally go for any interview somebody asks you what is an svm svm is nothing but again a classifier no doubt logistic regression is again a classifier decision tree is a classifier it's a it's a class as simple as a it's a but what does it do something is different uh, decision tree takes this splits like like a ladder goes on like if else if else ladder what does logistic regression do logistic regression does it like a s shape curve and finds out the boundary so we come to the understanding that what does an svm do support vector machine see the name only says machine is obviously machine machine learning ka machine hai okay support vector what does the word support vector see i'll give you a simple example let's leave all this uh, let's leave all this machine learning everything so all of us were children you may have children at your home your son daughter etc how do they learn to uh, walk or stand they try to take support 
initially so you would not have seen any child just standing and walking and running no right what they try to do is take the support of someone who is near to them either the parents i or the person who is looking after that child so svm is also like that it will see its data it will see its data both the data class 1 because what does it have it has one class other class i am taking simple problem class 2 class problem so it will take class 1 it will take class 2 what it say it will see the data right and it has to build a margin so this is the margin it has to build so here let's see that it's called a gap here but we have to build all of us do what we do margin so we build boundary means we are to going to build this boundary here margin we have to build right so what support vector machine does is obviously support vector machine is not this easy what i am trying to tell you i am trying to make it very easy okay support vector actually if told mathematically then it is an optimization problem uh, where you are going to put many constraints and come to the solution but here i am telling telling layman example right so the layman example is you have two classes so you have some children at home who want to stand up or walk then what they require they require support right so what here happens is the here the classifier wants to build the boundary it is being given data this svm goes on seeing the data it will see that okay uh, these people who are here na they are fairly okay they are fairly okay here see they are also okay i i can easily say that this is class 1 this is class 2 but when you come nearby here here their boundary is boundary is something like this the gap is something like this what it tries to do is it tries to take the support of the boundary elements <coughs> sorry it tries to take the support of the boundary elements so here it takes the support of this how it takes the support it has its mathematical conditions that i won't go into because it will not fall in the three classes i require to explain svm i can tell you in simple words that it will take the support of this it will take the support of this just like a child takes support of its parent right for class 1 for other class it sees it takes the support of this if there was some someone like this here na it will also take its support but here it is not shown assuming it's not there now what it tries to do is it will try to identify the gap now it has to build a boundary it will build a boundary at the distance by 2 so whatever is the distance it will do d by 2 why it does d by 2 is see here what i am trying to say i'll change the annotation here suppose it builds a boundary here suppose instead of building there suppose it builds a boundary here then it is giving more margin it is giving more margin to this person to class 2 it is giving less margin to class 1 unfair you have to be equal suppose it builds a boundary here vice versa happens it gives a more more percent to this person class 1 it will simply penalize class 2 so what it tries to do it tries to pick so i'll erase this so i'll erase all this it tries to pick the it tries to pick the best boundary by taking support uh, by taking data samples which are called which are at the boundary and analyze that and it will it will go on changing its boundary it's not that it is going to remain static during training during training it will go on moving if you go on giving samples here which are falling in between then it will change it dynamically it will change it will take training testing time it will take lot of training time but once it's seen all the samples once it is it is not an online classifier please mark it it's a, it's you have to train it you, you cannot do on the fly so you have to give it lot of sample once it start seeing all the samples and plots then it will go and check the boundary people and once it sees the boundary people it will take its support and it will try to build a boundary at d by 2 between these two people it will try to build a boundary okay so this is how your support vector machine does it takes the support of the boundary points for the two classes analyzes that and builds a compact boundary in between d by 2 of them if it goes on top if it takes more support from this then it is penalizing class 
and vice versa if it is taking more here it is penalizing this class okay so it tries to do this these two job it tries to do and builds a boundary in red color is shown this is how svm does this is the theory part of it svm is very complex uh, we have lot of equations to put i can put all that here and tell you but i don't want to go into that because my target now is to tell you about the how to use svm in google colab so let's go to the colab here so i was at colab here right support vector machine i am the classifier it is also called support vector classifier a support vector machine so here svm also it is called so as uh, my student has written it's more, one of the most popular classifiers here okay it takes the extreme points vectors whatever i have told same thing it is written here in text so i won't read it directly let us go so this is what it does some example is shown here by the student so he has shown this so i think our uh, jayant has done this notebook so this is jayant's work so now see import the svc classifier model from sk learn he has put text train and test the model train and test the model only two things i have see now see what i do i can increase the font here for you to look at it easily see from sk learn dot svm import right support vector classifier import it now what you do fit fit the training it will train you already have done train test separately already it's over you have done then do predict then do predict for same problem iris sentosa that same problem right let's run this it is not taking much time right this is the array in which it is so this is a big array so all these samples are classified like this right so i am not going into this let's go and show the accuracy again it comes 96% let's display the confusion matrix here confusion matrix prediction again you get 11 0 0 0 12 1 again one misclassification here one misclassification here and this is what is your this is what is your what is your support vector classifier so you see here what we have tried to do same data what is our data our data here come back come back here our data here i'll just reduce to my normal size because we have gone through this notebook now our data is the same though they have written we have shown images we are not giving image data as inputs we are giving simple text numbers we are giving what are the numbers simple width simple width all that we are giving okay how did we do only important part was this we have to import the libraries bring the data sets bring the models everything is in sk learn sk learn bring it right it's freely available load the data load the iris data many other data sets are also available from that you load it once loaded split it into train and test this is what is loaded and shown if you don't show this also it's okay okay then uh, feature matrix is showing here right so it is showing here then you split it into train and test thumb rule 80 20 go 80 20% then do what then you choose your classifier three three examples we have taken decision tree Uh, logistic regression support vector classifier or support vector machine three we have taken so here let me come back to my first session here let's go back and look at the data set again okay so iris data set how many flowers 150 flowers what is thumb rule 80 20 right what are the features these are the features right which are the features these features i am going to feed to the but for these features what i have to do split it into the into train and test thumb rule using thumb rule then use classifier we use decision tree we used uh, our logistic regression and we use support vector your svm support vector machine okay so here i'm just shopping stopping here okay to just ask you if uh, everything is okay if you require anything let's be more interactive here okay and i want to ask you if there is any doubts you can always let me know if you have not understood etc okay you can unmute or if you are feeling okay with the chat box you are comfortable okay you can just put it here yeah i think i am getting getting some questions how to get values for threshold values in decision tree how to automate okay answering this uh, from i think dr vishwanath is there so i think uh, it's asked by dr vishwanath 
so here uh, the answer would be here how to decide the threshold value threshold value is again uh, there is earlier days let's go to earlier days what we do we give manual threshold heuristic threshold it is called so what we do is we give some numbers like 0 0.8 0 0.6 0 0.7 based on some heuristics we run the experiment okay we work fine for this so let us fix this threshold so nowadays machine learning has gone to so large that even threshold selection we can go through a classifier so you give all this and say that which is the best threshold classifier will run across all the data and it will throw out the threshold so that also can come via training so nowadays we are not making fixed uh, thresholds what we are keeping we are keeping dynamic thresholds based on the data and that data is changing every time and we, we can use a classifier to give the output of that so uh, the threshold selection should not should uh, uh, is not very uh, uh, is not fixed like earlier days uh, because when we were doing phd we is doing uh, it heuristically but now it is very dynamic you can all classifiers do all the job so i think i am getting one more question here uh, how to use cross well yeah i think i have not told about cross validation because i want to keep it now simple <clears throat> i don't want to use cross validation all those stuff very difficult stuff now slowly we will uh, we will graduate i think my next class when we do there is some uh, things which we want to do and uh, next class onward it will be little bit difficult in the sense that i cannot press buttons like this it will not run because data set starts becoming very large in that case i have to say that i am giving you all the notebooks you see you can run it in 8 minutes 10 minutes because we cannot stop for 8 minutes for that to throw my results so i will show you github so in github uh, whenever you run any collab in github the results come like this so the same simulated uh, results will come uh, so the same results will come here so that i will show you in github but now we are starting simple we did three classifiers tomorrow the idea is to use uh, some other uh, let's use some other data set apart from iris and let's uh, do this that so that is the idea for tomorrow so today still it is not over i am having some other things to tell you so but i am just want i have stopped here to ask whether everything is okay with regard to understanding the simple notebook and my presentation number 1 is it okay or you require some i think there was some other how to fix gini values i think i got one of the yeah i was not audible because i forgot to unmute myself in between sorry for that uh, then i think i have what is gini value see uh, yeah i will not be able to tell you all the things reason is uh, reason is all uh, machine learning whatever we have done is so vast so so vast that majority of the time it is my students who are educating me on this i come from very old theory uh, i think dr vishwanath is here he is my co he is he was my senior when doing uh, uh, during my phd he was my senior so he knows all the things so here i come from very old thought that we faced a lot of difficulties when we did phd reason is all these uh, libraries were not available right and uh, that's how you also would see that many people come up with so many papers overnight how they do it they do it because nowadays so many libraries are available so big groups are available that they do it overnight just just call use throw it out so that's how it is going on nowadays so i am uh, i am very happy in the sense that i my students don't have to use much many things but it's it has a drawback in the sense they they don't know how to write basic code so if if it is given to me or say dr vishwanath here we are accustomed to writing basic codes from c c++ all that and we are not accustomed to using libraries but there is a generation change we should stay as the generation goes so that's how it is so we take it with a pinch of salt that everything is good so i think with this uh, my next part would be to tell you the github part machine learning for everyone giving you the link and i think professor bernie also i'll just tell you summary of what professor bernie is trying to say because some amount of because professor bernie is one among the stalwarts in uh, mathematics as well as machine learning his group is very good in security right but uh, let me explain some parts of it because i also heard him once i uh, when i was in hong kong i heard him and i could get i could say get what he what he was trying to say and then we interacted that's how it came so let me tell you some few things which are necessary uh, from the understanding point of view so let me share my screen here so now i'll show you the general part 
coverage for today is over in the sense that we have covered three classifiers i don't want to rush with some other data set no it becomes very uh, means very plain and i don't want to go plain i always keep my sessions as short interactive as uh, possible so that i can talk with many many people and get your inputs okay and i may not know many things because my students are there they are those people who are day and night working uh, more than me i am more busy nowadays with administrative stuff which has been assigned to me but still i make it a point to give my own research sometime so let me share my screen and tell you few things which are in the open sense so i'll just uh, stop sharing this go back to this so i think few people asked me about my i got one question here where i got about my youtube channel so youtube uh, they wanted my youtube channel's link so i'll just give my youtube link for those people who are asking here so my channel link i am putting on uh, on my chat here to my participants who are listening to me so one of the participant has asked this so this is out of context but still i am putting it right because i try to answer all the questions whatever come to me so this is my youtube channel uh, you can hear few of my uh, my uh, talks here and there what i give uh, whatever i whenever i have got time i have tried to put some or the other talks so you could just listen to this whether you subscribe or like or i don't do all that i am a non commercial person i am a teacher so if you want to like you like you don't like don't like doesn't matter okay so this is my youtube channel what one of your participants was asking so i'm coming to the github uh, and the repository what i am trying to say so this is for machine learning for everyone this will be emailed to you so this is a public repository by my students so i will be giving you this before that i'll tell you what is github so github is something like uh, you can do your you can also do your websites on github you just like google sites so i have my website uh, on uh, uh, github so here you could see this uh, this is my website on github so i have my own and again i say that this this github is your repository is not done by me again it is one of my students sweta so sweta did this for me she is electrical engineering student so she has done this for me my own uh, all my things she has put online okay so this is what you can uh, you can do on github so uh, you can do websites also on github in addition to that you can keep your data so this is my github so i'll share these links later whenever you find time you go through it it tells you what what are the uh, publications and what uh, i do in research so then one more you can use it as a repository so you can keep all your data on github and keep make it public so you have an option here of making it public and you give sharing it for others so now just now whatever example i have taken i have taken non ensemble methods i have not explained what is non ensemble and all tomorrow onwards i'll get more technical okay so this is the github see same thing i i ran in colab there here i cannot run it i have to go to colab and run but but you see this here i am having my here i am having the same thing all these three things after that importing see import pand but i cannot run it it is already run from colab it has been brought here because i don't need to run this because tomorrow day after tomorrow onwards my notebooks will become complex it will become complex in the sense uh, they will not run they are still simple i try to explain things simply only they are, they are not in that uh, complex means i am not going to use abstract math here but complex in the sense time consuming so when it becomes time consuming i cannot wait for 8 minutes for to run because of limitation of time that we have for the workshop so i am going to go to my github my students uh, uh, a github which where you are going to get all these values so whatever i showed now in colab tomorrow also i'll try to do little bit of colab then we'll go to github and only explain or else becomes very difficult i'll try on my right hand side to put colab and keep it running if it gets over then i'll show you the result because i want to tell all of you that any of this material which has been brought here is not that doesn't work okay please understand i will be the saddest person if somebody says that the colab notebooks which you gave are doesn't work sir okay or the codes what you have given is all bogus it doesn't work yeah, i'll be the saddest person i won't sleep on that day okay because for me the sharing uh, the uh, knowledge sharing is very important 
to here the same github here so we put create train and test data set whatever decision tree three classifiers we took today decision tree is one okay and uh, uh, dr vishwanath asked me about how the decision rule thresholds are selected again via classifier again we can do a classifier training testing there okay so creating so you same thing tree dot decision classifier here so the same thing here you can see whatever we did the score is a uh, jayant has done this so jayant knows all of this so here he uh, he brought next the logistic regression into picture so which i have also explained in my slide then lastly after uh, finding out again logistic regression as i told again import predict fit and predict then after that coming to the uh, confusion matrix what we did so then the support vector classifier same thing whatever we did in colab i am just showing you on github same thing here same on colab in github it won't run from uh, in colab it will run colab is google github is not is a open repository so you can keep this and share with others so not only these uh, uh, python notebooks you can also make websites you can also keep your pdfs so if there are any faculty here you can keep your projects you can keep your class material here you can keep your code here so all of this is available easily so that it can be shareable only with the github link right so with this i think here one more part what i want to say here is with regard to the uh, codes so here with the publications so whatever codes are there so if you want you can go to these codes in my uh, on my github see all my codes so cnn camera motion classification curl icvj these are all my papers so my papers in the sense my papers are now a little bit down here uh, but these are all my student papers it's been long time that i finished phd so they are my student papers so we, whenever they publish they, we put it up on our github so i think this uh, cnn belongs to pawan curl belongs to pawan then nandita and all these students whoever have done or we all keep it here anybody can go here say a download so once you say download it will download on your drive okay so here that we keep here and also we keep it at our site so for those people who want with who are comfortable with google so you can google you can go to my google sites so here also we are going to keep our site so you can go to publications if you are not com comfortable with github so you can come here and also you could take all my codes from here and all of these are working codes and in fact this is how i got to know professor moro burni that when we met in hong kong i presented that and he asked me how then i had a, my laptop there i could show him how it works then after that they compared with our results and they got better results than their group got re better results than us and that's how our codes are shareable they exchange that so that's how we know each other and now it has a gyan course has materialized so with this this is my free research which we use for doing the publications so these are the general things that i am talking today about this and coming to this uh, part where we are uh, talking about uh, the outline for tomorrow i think we are almost it's 8:40 till 9 so i'll just give you an outline for tomorrow what we have planned so tomorrow session is uh, planned for uh, professor moro burni will be joining us in the evening as i have told you he is going he is occupied in the morning so he is be going in the evening so i have a session here uh, where the same problem i am going to take tomorrow morning where i am going to tell ensemble methods so i'll tell you tomorrow of course this is for coverage for tomorrow ensemble methods where we are going to tell you the same 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 ones again iris versi color setosa and virginica and uh, its classification itself iris dataset but by using other things like bagging boosting little bit complex then what uh, we are going to do then after that tomorrow we are going to start with cnns so it's an important part at 9:30 we start i know that many of you are working or maybe uh, having uh, issues joining but uh, try to use this opportunity because so that you can uh, uh, learn all this part although we give you the we give you all the uh, this recorded part but recorded doesn't have much meaning uh, unless unless it is seen live so that you can interact with me so convolution neural networks is going to start after so one hour i am going to cover ensemble classifiers so again it's a new part what you are going to learn but it's going to be continuation of what we have done today so we have learned about simple classifiers only decision three things we have learned simple things but now we are going to make it a little bit complex 
and i'm just going to tell you this example also runs in colab when runs in the colab means it will take less time but when i go to cnn uh, i think my, my student ojashwi has done this so uh, in the cnn when we go and do the digit recognition it takes a lot of time the time i go to my github and there i try to explain how it is done so with this i think it's 18840 so cnn is the coverage for me tomorrow and along with that i have a uh, because the same way i cover uh, that uh, i tomorrow cover also examples of what is uh, this many uh, this ai ml and dl how how this is different how this is same then there is also a book what we are going to see on deep learning and we are going to go because many people ask me whether books are available or not yet that we are going to talk and we are going to talk about all this ai ml from the general perspective and bring in cnns so tomorrow we are going to get introduced to cnns so very important convolution you should know because if you miss the convolution part then entire of machine or deep learning becomes very very difficult for you again as usual i'll try to use my simplistic knowledge and give you common analogies for tomorrow's part so then i hope that we will be able to get into cnns again day by day example so that we can make it more effective so with this i am stopping the sharing for this as well as if everything is okay then we are we may end at uh, some 5 10 minutes later so if there are any questions i would like to take any questions i think i got one request from one of the participants i know madam well so madam asked me whether i can start my sessions from in the afternoon the answer is no because uh, the schedule is jam packed and uh, this schedule is being monitored by gyan portal from uh, in the central portal they are being uh, they are seeing our youtube channel they have been sent our they have been sent with our uh, with our schedule and they are monitoring us uh, the the entire session is being monitored via youtube so uh, our uh, streaming is also going on on youtube and it is being monitored from the gyan that uh, that we are uh, we are engaging all the classes as well as taking all the sessions in, uh, including the youtube uh, things as well as with regard to the collab things all the hands on sessions so tomorrow's session would be as i again repeat important because tomorrow's understanding is required for day after and all that so we'll start with uh, that at 9:30 i'll try to give security examples because i won't find time to finish it in 15 minutes security why security is important in machine learning that also we'll try to do it tomorrow and we'll uh, meet again in the evening with 5 uh, it is 1 so it's 5:30 i think professor burnie is going to join us with more of his uh, parts where he is going to slowly come into adversarial signal processing so with this i think it's done from my side i think if i'll check my chat box if somebody wants to un unmute and uh, talk to me you can always do that don't feel anything here uh, we are all equal so i always uh, accept that if i don't know anything i'll be the first person say that i don't know so one of the student uh, participant asked me what is gini so i really don't know what is that gini so you have to uh, pardon me for that so i'll be that kind of person if i don't know i'll say i don't so with this if you have anything then we can uh, if there is anything you can discuss or else we'll close for this day maybe it's a long session today for you whoever have been attending continuously so we can take a break so is it okay yeah so i think uh, 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 we are now uh, this i think i have stopped my recording so we are in a position to leave so i'll be leaving the meeting and uh, uh, we will be meeting again tomorrow 9:30 we are tight on our schedule so 9:30 means yes of course five ten minutes i can reduce from the top but when we start we start and uh, again burn professor burney session is again we start so we cannot change our schedule we i am very sorry for that if you have any uh, joining but try to join via phones etc and if you are sitting in any institutes you are free to use this and put it project it on your screens so we have not kept uh, for certification only there is some fund that there is some money etc only for certification others can easily see it and put it in the uh, full screen mode of their institutes and they can listen to us so as much benefit whoever is getting we are happy to give that so with this i am leaving my meeting today i am ending the meeting also today 
so again we are meeting tomorrow morning 9:30 with my session so thank you for joining today and for a patient hearing anything is there and we'll i'll try to see whether i can reach out to professor burney and send the slides before we start tomorrow hopefully if that is done then it will be good so with this i am ending my meeting for this so thank you for joining thank you all